that. All right, good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Rolando Bonilla, and I am the chair of the San Jose Planning Commission. Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting. The meeting is being held via Zoom conference call due to the COVID-19 crisis. Members of the public may participate by following the instructions listed on the agenda. You may also view and listen to the meeting on live stream cable TV, Granicus, and YouTube. Following roll call summary of hearing procedure, we will review how the public may provide comment during today's session. Welcome. Roll call Bonilla here. Casey? Here. Caballero? And I know Caballero has got a sore throat, so if I could see a thumbs up, that'll suffice. I believe Caballero is here. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell? Here. Garcia? Here. Lardenois? Here. Montañez? Montañez? Okay. Oliverio? Oliverio? Ornelas Wise? Here. Torrance? Here. All right, bye -bye. Young? Here. I'll let the record reflect that at the moment, Commissioners Montañez and Oliverio are not present. All right, summary of hearing procedures. The procedure for this hearing is as follows. After the staff report, applicants and appellants may make a five minute presentation. City staff will call out names of the public who identified the items they want to speak on. You may identify yourself by the raised hand feature on Zoom. Click star nine on your phone, or you may call 408-535-3505 for email planning support staff at sanjoseca.gov and identify your name, phone number, and what items you'd like to speak on. As your name is called, city staff will unmute you to speak. After we confirm your, after we confirm your audio is working, your allotted time will begin. Each speaker will have two minutes. Speakers using a translator will have four minutes. After the public testimony, the applicant and appellant may make closing remarks for an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. Response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. Staff will unmute the speaker to respond to the commissioner. The public hearing will then be closed and the planning commission will take action on the item. The planning commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions and discuss the item. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. The, plumbing, the, pump, the planning commissions, I'm sorry. The planning commission's actions on rezonings, pre-zonings, general plan amendments and code amendments is only advisory to the city council. The city council will hold the public hearings on these items. Section 20.120400 of the municipal code provides the procedure for legal protest to the city council on rezonings and pre-zonings. The planning commission's action on conditional use permits is appealable to the city council in accordance with section 20.100.220 of the municipal code. We will now move to call to orders and orders of the day. Uh, staff, I will be moving item 5B to immediately after the consent calendar. Outside of that, we will now move to public comment. Staff, do we have any speakers for public comment on items not on the Planning Commission agenda? Jennifer, is there any public comment, general public comment? It looks like we have a few hands raised. Let me go ahead and unmute and see if this is for um, general public comment. Brian, um, do you have a comment for anything that's not on the agenda tonight? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead, you have two minutes. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Brian Darby. I didn't put the full name on there. <clears throat> and I would like to uh, point out that the um, planning commission does have a lot of um, power and a lot of us who have gone to planning commission literally for decades really felt like, um, and I'm not saying that this is you, but our, our interpretation is we weren't heard at all, that the decisions were already made before we even came out of the vote and started it. And that public hearing really was an exercise in absolute utter futility. And I can tell you that I have felt that way a lot. And um, a lot of us would come to the meetings, especially when we used to drive there before COVID happened. And now even taking our time here. And it just seemed like it was not appreciated at all. You know, it was like we were bothering people to be really quite honest. Now I haven't been to a meeting for a while because of that 
sense I've had. And I sort of am frustrated because I want to be part of the dialogue and we're told to be part of the dialogue. And um, when we do try to be part of the dialogue, it's um, a large part of what we write is ignored. And, um, you know, when you say comments, um, and I just find it very exasperating, to be honest with you. Now that may have changed because the uh, uh, city council has changed a lot of the uh, way the the planning commission operates. There's been more people offered, but I can tell you the decisions you make carry a lot of weight, and people only have you to reach out to and to our city officials. And for some reason, that seems to bother people. I, I don't understand it, but it does. And it's not when we comment, when we say things. It's not to challenge your integrity. It's not to say that you're bad people. We're not saying that's not a personal issue. It's just that we really care about what happens here in San Jose. And I would hope that would be understood. It doesn't really seem to be at times. And I'm just sharing with you how me and a lot of other people uh, feel at times. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, we have Magdalena. Magdalena, can you please confirm if it's if you're going to be speaking on um, just a public comment, nothing on the agenda? Thank you so much. Uh, no, I'm I'm raising my hand for five B. I apologize. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and meet you, and then um, when we get to that item, you can state your comment. Next speaker, please. Next is um, ending in one four zero. Um, please state if this is for the general public comment. Yes. Yes. Hoping that you guys make the right decision for the public. Don't be in the pockets of the developers or other special interest groups. So the whole public, I mean, these decisions affect the, the infrastructure of our city. And if you say widen the borders or you want to make denser housing, whatever, that means we're going to need more infrastructure. And this city has been unable to provide infrastructure with what it has. Now, with you know, the, they want to grow these urban villages and everything. Is there enough police, fire, water, electricity? You know, we're going to be going to an all-electric grid soon without natural gas. What's, how is that going to affect everybody? And they're talking about carbon footprint. Well, the more people you want to pack in, more people are going to make uh, more carb, a, a bigger carbon footprint, whether they take a bus or not. So you guys have to think about what you're capable of handling now. And if you ask me, you guys are doing a poor job managing the city. At least the city council, but the planners, you guys want to make things bigger. It's not going to be better. Do you really think that 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 it's gonna it's gonna be good for the, the residents that already have clogged roads and freeways? I mean, it's better now during the pandemic, but wait a couple of years when if this thing ever goes away, what's gonna happen? You're not gonna have the resources, gas, water, electricity, like I said before. You know, a policeman doesn't show up for another for an hour sometimes. So they're gonna show up sooner when we have more people causing more trouble. The fire department, I mean, you ever seen the burned out buildings in this town across the street from a firehouse? I've seen it. Remember the flames on Hillsdale, the restaurant went up in flames across the street from the firehouse. Do you mean to tell me you guys have good response times? Or, no, you don't. You guys can't even fix a fountain at the Rose Garden. How are you going to be able to, to make a... Okay, time is up. Next speaker, we have Erica G. Erica, please go ahead and unmute yourself and confirm if this is just public comment. Erica? Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, James Chung, please go ahead and unmute your device. James? Okay. okay, Erica, I see that you're able to unmute yourself. Um, do you have a comment for public comment um, items not on the agenda? Um, not now. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go ahead thank and you. unmute yourself. And then our uh, James, can you please unmute your device?
Um, can you just skip for right now? Thank you. This concludes all of our speakers, Chair. All right, well, thank you for that. We will now move on to item three, deferrals and removals from calendar staff. Do we have any items to defer today? All right, seeing none, I'm now moving to the consent calendar. Colleagues, anything on the consent calendar you'd like to pull? Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and take a roll call vote. Bonilla, aye. Casey? Aye. Caballero? Caballero, is that a yes? Yep, that's a yes. Thank you. Cantrell? Aye. Garcia? Aye. Garcia? Martin aye. Watt? Aye. Montañez? Okay. Oliverio? Ornelas Wise? Aye. Torrance? Aye. Young? Aye. The motion passes. The item passes. Uh, nine to two. I mean, nine. Oh, oh. Chair Bonilla, pardon me. Who made the motion and seconded it? I missed oh. that. <laughs> so did I. Uh, I. I just so went for the vote. We need to do, yeah. we need to do that again. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and make the motion. Second. second it. Young with the second. We'll take that roll call vote again. Wait, 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 wait. Who made the first? Who made the second? It went by Bo so Bonilla, Bonilla made the first. Young made the second. Who made the second? Young. Okay, yeah, Young. Right. Okay. Young. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Cantrell? That's a yes for Caballero. Cantrell? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Lord and Watt? Yes. Montañez? Oliverio? Yes. Yes. Ornelas Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. Young? Yes. The, there go. The item passes. Apologize for that. My excitement for these rules, you know, the, uh... all right. So now move to item 5B. Let's begin with a staff presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. This is Laura Miners, the Planning Project Manager for this request for a conditional use permit to allow the construction of two six-story buildings, including a mixed-use building with commercial space on the ground floor and 119 units of 100% affordable multifamily residences, and one building with 45 units of 100% affordable multifamily residences with podium parking on the ground floor of both buildings on a 1.32 acre site located at 2880 Alum Rock Avenue. Since 100% of the residential units are affordable, the project is eligible to receive a density bonus, reduced parking ratios, and incentives or waivers to development standards under the provisions of the state density bonus law per government code section 65915. The project is not requesting a density bonus, but only needs to be eligible for the density bonus in order to request incentives, including reductions in development standards to facilitate the economically viable construction of affordable housing. The project is allowed three incentive requests. Local jurisdictions are required to grant the incentives requested by the developer unless it finds that the requested incentive does not result in identifiable and actual cost reductions, would cause a public health or safety problem, would cause an environmental problem, would harm historic property, or would be contrary to law. The project has requested two incentives, including a reduction to the required private and common open space and a reduction to the front setback. The applicant provided cost documentation 
showing actual and identifiable cost reductions associated with both incentive requests and therefore the incentives can be granted. The site is currently developed with a vacant commercial building and associated surface parking. Single family residential properties are located north of the project site across Alum Rock Avenue. And there are multifamily residential units to the south of the project site. The adjacent properties to the east and west along the frontage of Alum Rock Avenue are comprised of commercial retail, restaurants, and a salon. The site is within the Neighborhood Community Commercial General Plan land use designation, the CN Commercial Neighborhood Zoning District, and the Allen Rock Avenue east of 680 Urban Village area, which is designated as a future urban village plan not yet prepared or adopted. Mixed use projects with ground floor commercial and residential uses above are allowed with a conditional use permit. This project is subject to and consistent with general plan policy IP-5.12, which allows 100% affordable residential projects within the neighborhood community commercial designation ahead of the adoption of the urban village plan, subject to additional qualifying factors, such as substantially replacing any commercial use being demolished. The neighborhood community commercial designation does not otherwise allow residential uses. A mitigated negative declaration was prepared for the project, which concluded that the project will not result in any significant and unavoidable impacts. Mitigation measures were identified to reduce impacts to less than significant for nesting birds and construction noise. The initial study and mitigated negative declaration were circulated for a 20 day comment period from August 13th to September 2nd, 2021. No comments were received. Bethlehem Telehoon is the environmental project manager for this project and is available to answer questions regarding the environmental review. Planning staff received public comments regarding the project's height parking and potential traffic impacts. In response to the parking comments, the state density bonus law per government code section 65915 states that if a project provides at least 11% very low income housing and is within one half mile of a major transit stop, the number of required vehicle parking spaces for multifamily residential units is 0.5 parking spaces per unit. The project qualifies for this parking ratio by providing 20% of the total units restricted for extremely low and very low income households earning up to 50% AMI. And by the project site being within half a block of bus route 25, which meets the definition of a major transit stop. The project is therefore el eligible for the parking ratio of 0.5 spaces per unit per the provisions of the state density bonus law. Local jurisdictions are prohibited from requiring more than this ratio per state law. In response to the comments regarding the project height, the zoning code states that, the pro that projects within urban villages are limited in height to 120 feet. The subject project is 76 and a half feet in height, which complies with the requirement. Lastly, in response to potential traffic impacts, Michelle Kimball, senior engineer with the development of public, uh, with the Department of Public Works is in attendance and will be able to summarize the impacts and answer any questions. Planning also received letters of support for the project from community advocacy groups, such as the Housing Action Coalition and SV at Home, and from District 5 Council, Mem Council Member Magdalena Carrasco. Staff therefore recommends that the commissioners find that the project is in conformance with the California Environmental Quality Act and approve the conditional use permit. This concludes staff's presentation.
Thank you for that. Can we now uh, have the applicant make their make their presentation? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Laura. Fantastic job. There's, you covered a lot. Um, but here, let me pull up my slides here. Can everybody see this okay? Great. Uh, my name is Darren Barbarian. I'm the business developer for Pacific West Communities. I also have with me Salvador Madera from AO Architects and Pete Carrillo. Uh, as you can see here, we are an affordable housing developer uh, since two, uh, 1998. We have over 165 developments, all affordable housing, 10,000 plus units, uh, predominantly in California. We also develop charter schools and some commercial assets. This is the existing site. It's an underutilized site that has been closed for about three, four years, completely underutilized and um, hasn't been in business for several years. This is gonna be a modular construction. It has 164 units, as Laura mentioned, with 7,000 square feet of new and usable commercial space. As you can see, the unit mix is 92 studios, 58 one bedrooms and 14 two bedrooms. We're anticipating uh, the project to be delivered in 2024, 2025. This will also be a lead silver build. After some many community meetings, um, not just the city held community meetings, we had some very meaningful conversations with the community. And one of them was to try to add some uh, green space to the project. And we came up with a very clever way to add it and also soften the initial frontage on Alum Rock height. And I'll show you that in the next few slides. And with, you know, with meeting with the community and hearing the concerns and wanting to stay involved, what I've requested to the community is to create an advisory, advisory committee post PC hearing to continue the conversations you know, throughout the process because it, it is a lengthy process even after a potential approval at the city level. This is 100% affordable family community. You have two on-site managers living there 24 hours a day. We also have on-site services as you can see here uh, that are educational health and wellness, skill building classes, uh, financial literacy, computer training, home buyer education, GD, resume building, ESL, nutrition, exercise, health information, awareness, art, parenting, on-site food cultivation and preparation and smoking cessation. And it'll be provided at a minimum of 84 hours per year. And we also have health and wellness services such as um, will include indiv individualized support for tenants, not group classes. The service would include, but not limited to, visiting nurse programs, intergenerational visiting programs, and senior companion programs. And these will be offered at a minimum of 100 hours per year. I also wanted to show the arena numbers. I'm sure the commissioners are all very well aware of the city's requirement for uh, regional housing needs assessment. As you can see in the very low and low category, moderate category, those are the three uh, categories we will be hitting. Uh, this project has both very low, or all three, very low, low, and moderate. And you can see at the bottom there, the housing goal of 10,000 units uh, and currently where they're at with construction and entitlements and completion at 3,149 units. My taskbar over here. Here are some front elevations. Now these will be different than what you have in your staff report commissioners. Um, after the many, many meetings we've had with the community, uh, we wanted to make some changes. And the most notable change is if you see, look here to the left here, you'll see the garden uh, rooftop deck here. So originally, you know, and I'll show you a side by side in the next slide, but it was all one building here. We didn't have that cut out. So what it did does is breaks up that frontage and also provides a green space, which uh, really looks fantastic. Also uh, on the ground level here, uh, the community want to see an active frontage with tables and chairs and, and people congregating. And so we added that. Um, we are gonna try to do our best to add as much more, more landscaping as possible when we move forward here. You can see the before and after. So the before was one straight shot. You have a little bit of a difference 
uh, between the white building and the brown building there. But as you can see after when we added the rooftop garden that it, it made a, a real big difference. And this is another view south along Alum Rock Avenue. And this is a view of building A from the rear. And this is a view of the building A at ground activity. And that concludes my slides. I'm available for any questions and would really appreciate your time and consideration of our proposal. Darren, thank you for that presentation. We now have a uh, public comment. Uh, Jen, do we have any uh, folks lined up for public comment? Yes, um, our first speaker is Magdalena. Um, please go ahead and unmute yourself and begin to speak. There we go. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Magdalena Carrasco. I'm the council member for District 5, our beautiful east side of San Jose, and I want to thank each of the commissioners for their time and their dedication to our city. I know that this is not always an easy job. I don't normally comment during these meetings. I trust that you are thorough and that you're thoughtful in your deliberation, but today I'm compelled I'm compelled to comment because we are facing a humanitarian crisis unlike anything that we've ever seen, anything that we've ever experienced. Our families are living in overcrowded conditions, two to three under the same roof. This is neither uh, an ideal situation nor a desirable situation, especially for the young, uh, the young child. Many of our families work multiple jobs and live in enclosed multifamily, multi-generational homes that put them at an inherently greater risk during the, uh, during the pandemic. District 5, the east side of San Jose, was home to three of the most impacted zip codes from COVID-19. Three of the five zip codes, by the way, that saw the greatest infection numbers and the greatest loss of life. Now we have real time, lifetime lessons to learn from. We need to provide housing and not doing so when we can is negligent on our behalf. I want to uh, just really recommend the project that was just uh, presented today. It will begin to tackle our housing crisis by providing 164 units of affordable housing. This doesn't just translate to 164 doors, it translates to 164 families that will finally have a sense of security in an unsecure world. Uh, to provide a roof over the heads of families and, and children means to provide uh, that kind of stability so desperately needed in our community. I hear what the community is asking for. I've been listening in on the meetings. It's a well-articulated vision for the corridor, but I, I need to remind you, we cannot let perfection be the enemy of progress. I urge you, I urge you to allow this project to move forward. Council member, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, since we're basically neighbors, we could have done a Zoom together from the front lawn here. <laughs> <laughs> you could have given me a right to the office. <laughs> there you go. Good to see you. Public call. Next speaker, please. <laughs> Next, we have Umberto. Umberto, go ahead and unmute yourself and begin to speak. Um, good evening, Chair and fellow commissioners. My name is Umberto Nava, and I am a representative of Carpenters Local 405 here in Santa Clara County. And on behalf of over 7,600 members, I ask you to deny the resolution before you this evening. Pacific West Community intends to truck modular housing units, most likely from Idaho. As for the 40% of the work that will be performed on site, Pacific West does not require payment of very standard wages or benefits on other jobs, including this one. So we can expect that most workers will earn one half of prevailing wage and probably one half health insurance. Silicon Valley contractors employ 5,000 few fewer people in May 2021 than they did pre-pandemic. One half of Santa Clara County households that includes construction workers have incomes that qualify as extremely low, very low, or low income. Those families need jobs, and jobs that pay every standard wages and benefits, employ apprentices, and provide health insurance. Just two days ago, the California Labor Commissioner issued citations in excess of $7 million to a subcontractor that Pacific West Communities has used in the recent past and affected 724 workers. Is this a type, type of contract we want in our community? How about developing the workforce here locally and putting members in the community to work instead of having it built someplace else and having it assembled here? 
Very little of the economic benefits will stay here in the city of San Jose. So again, I'm asking the United States resolution before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Next public speaker, please. Next speaker, we have Mary Val Valderrama. Mary, go ahead and unmute yourself and begin to speak. Um, good evening. Uh, thanks to all the commissioners for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about my concern about the three urban villages. Uh, the first two that have already started being worked on a little bit from 101 to Capitol Avenue. If you look at that area, if you drive up Allen Rock and you look at that area from um, 101 to Capitol, you'll notice that there's various developers that come in and they just are dropping whatever design building they want. And so there's no consistent look and feel in the area at all. They have also uh, promised retail, but there's no retail. It's just empty, the bot bottom floor. So what that's causing is a lot of tagging. There's tagging everywhere between 101 and Capitol. And so basically that area looks like um, it appears that so it appears that the city is not holding the developer or the landlord to keeping the building in good shape. So it basically looks like the projects when you go up 101 to Capitol Avenue. And so my concern is with the third urban village, which is Capitol to White Road, is that the plan for that area too, to have different developers come in and, and plop in whatever style of building that they want, not provide retail. Um, our area, we, we really, we're not totally opposed to these to this ur, um, urban village and to these developers because we understand people need homes, but we want better looking. We want a better looking urban village. Um, I'm not saying it has to be the Alameda or or Japantown or Willow Glen, but it has to be better than what's going on right now between 101 and Capitol Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Ron Hansen. Please go ahead and unmute yourself and begin to speak. Uh, hello, commissioners. I'm Ron Hansen, a 47-year resident of the Alum Rock neighborhood. San Jose has defined the Alum Rock Avenue corridor as one of several San Jose Grand Boulevards, a key focal region within our city. Keeping this in mind, this development one of the first projects within this portion of Allen Rock Avenue must be considered a design precedent for further residential developments along this corridor. Consequently, although city regulations allow for a street facing flat front design, softening the front with articulation features and upper story setbacks would bring the project more into line with its surrounding neighbors. A similar request articulation features and upper story setbacks is appropriate for the rear of the six story project, which directly abuts a one and two story residential neighborhood. These uh, suggestions are included in page 71 of the San Jose citywide design standards and guidelines. Lastly, this developer has listened to the community and has honored the request that green space be included in the Mac to the maximum extent possible by including a rooftop green area on the main building. It's critical that this must be acknowledged. However, it's equally important that greenery, bushes and trees and such be included at ground level as well. Doing so will also soften the visual impact and maintain a human scale to the project. We appreciate the time and consideration the developers have given to our community in pursuit of this project. We urge you all to consider and agree with those few but important design requests before pro providing your final approval for this Grand Boulevard precedent setting affordable income project. Re reviewing what the new village will look like is really the responsibility of this commission. So I urge you to think carefully about it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Brian. Brian, go ahead and unmute your device and begin to speak. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I agree with what the other uh, speakers have said. And I was a wonderful project. I like that. Uh, um, I work with people with developmental disabilities, and as they uh, students get older, they need a place to stay too. <laughs> it's not good. So anything that would help, I like the setback, the greenery. The I hope with when it gets built out, and there's more. Uh, BTA is up to actually transporting folks there because one one of the linchpins that isn't working for 2040 is you know that last mile. 
before you go out, you know, you, you, you have to, um, I might do something. I did something on the bus that took seven hours. Then I did it in my car and it took 45 minutes. So those are things that drive a, um, I don't know, I'm not, I don't have anything written out. I'm just talking about the, what I'm thinking about. Though that's what breaks down a project. I was living in the Winchester Ranch for, um, you know, 30 years and then that changed. And they have projects going on there too. And that's going to be the death pen for a lot of those places because the buses don't work. They're not very dependable. And the cutout answers you get from BTA, no offense, but doesn't solve the problems of getting people to where they have to go. And people who are um, lower income, they have cars too. You know, They have a way that they have to get items and get them, take their kids places and a lot. Of, and I, I hope you get what I'm saying. I do like the project. The developer seemed like he cared. Um, so a lot more than the one that our, our group dealt with, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we have Jonathan Corin. Jonathan, go ahead and mute your device. Yes, thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Jonathan Corin. I live in the Alamora neighborhood here for 11 years. I actually live very close and walk up and down Alam Rock right where this development is. Uh, I'm, I support this development. We do, as the, uh, the council member said, we do have a housing crisis in San Jose and we do need these affordable housing. One of the things I really appreciate about this development and the all the villages along Alam Rock is that Alam Rock itself right now is kind of an eyesore. Um, it's a lot of empty lots. It's a lot of abandoned commercial buildings. We do need the housing. I do look for this and other developments along Alum Rock to actually make this a much more of a walkable neighborhood where not only like people live, but actually is a decent place to actually visit. So I do support this and I hope that the commission approves it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next we have Kat Wortham. Great, thank you. Uh, so good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Kat Wortham, and I'm the South Bay and Peninsula Organizer for the Housing Action Coalition. Um, and here tonight to also speak in support for this project. Uh, we also organized an online petition and received 81 supporters of this proposal. So I think there's a pretty good showing that, you know, folks in the area and folks in San Jose are in support. Um, just want to kind of echo some of the comments that we've heard so far that you know San Jose needs housing, but it really needs a lot of affordable housing, and this project brings that to this community. Um, we're really excited that this project is close to light rail and bus lines and a future BART station. Fingers crossed it won't take um, more than 10 years to get here. Um, we also really like the BART bike parking that's on site as well. Um, and really just excited to see that so many folks are out in support tonight. So hope you can be in support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Jesse Haro. Hi, good evening. This is Jesse Haro. I'm a member of the Allen Rock Village Action Committee and definitely a resident of Allen Rock for over 30 years. Um, I mean, it looks, and then looking at the uh, the site and what they plan to do, uh, we, we met with the developers and had some great conversations. And as Darren mentioned, uh, it you know they did uh, were open to improvements, but but what what alarmed me over the past several months is um, just these uh, projects springing up and then the box building springing up along Allen Rock and so it gave us great concern in the neighborhood as to what what truly is taking place and uh, the sense that there's really no real planning going on. Um, because uh, there was actually another SB 35 uh, proposal only 300 feet away from this 2880 site. Um, and so what I'm saying is, uh, I realize affordable housing is a positive move, but in general, what I'm thinking is, where is our vision? You know, you, I get excited because I look and I see brochures on uh, downtown vision, share the vision. Downtown San Jose is becoming everyone's extraordinary city center, the West Coast largest rail hub, connected through four distinct districts, a dynamic creative employment and education center. Where is our brochure? We are deserving, just as the other parts of the city are. We, the east side of San Jose, the orphans of San Jose, 
are deserving of a vision. And what it made me think is, um, and, and listening to Michael Belliot last week in the town hall, he talks about the third urban village, which is where we, we reside, that it hasn't started yet, but the affordable housing proposals are going in. So how can you have an urban village that, that hasn't started and you haven't put the team together, but you're, but you're voting in and looking at uh, these, these uh, developments. So I'm just saying, let's take a breather. Let's, let's, let's not put the cart in front of the horse and let's start to give the Alum Rock area a plan, a team to look at our vision and, does, and how is that infrastructure gonna look and how is the design gonna look that's also gonna give us the vibrancy, the local cultural, the prosperous businesses, uh, the easy walkable and bikeable trails and a transportation leader in our area as well. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we have Daisy Orosio. Hello. Um, good evening, commissioners. My name is Daisy Barosio, and I'm here to speak as part of the Ellen Rock Village Action Committee. Um, and I'm actually really glad, I'm going a little off script what I was going to say, um, that our council member and um, Jesse just spoke before, because it's really important that we note that, like, here we are... Ellen Rock neighbors who have come together to advocate for the betterment of our community. But we are deep, deeply concerned about the development that's potentially going to be happening without a meaningful plan to guide the process. Um, Jesse articulated so well, like what's the vision? And while you're not voting today on a vision, you are setting the tone. So today you're voting on one project, but more will follow. It is important that the development in the Ellen Rock community is done with the community's involvement. Yes, we absolutely want affordable housing in our neighborhood, and we want to ensure our neighbors are not being displaced. I know and I serve a community where we have many, many families living under one home, and they deserve to continue living in our neighborhood in a home that they feel safe, they are able to receive the services they need, and that they're not displaced. So in order to do this, we need everyone's support in there, and we need all stakeholders to be involved in the process. Yes, even those who don't speak English and can attend a commission meetings, so while technic technically um, there's a lot of things that allow these developments to be approved without community engagement, it is simply unethical. And we would like to see you to take a stand to ensure that meaningful dialogue and planning is taking place. This specific developer, yes, will recognize, has reached out to us, but there is no promise that this will continue or be required for other developers. We urge you to please, please, please advocate for a thoughtful urban village plan to guide any further developments um, we don't want to see, as many of um, our other neighbors have noted, random buildings. We may not be pulling and saying we want a Powell Alto, we want to... Daisy, your time is up. Our next speaker um, is with phone number 140. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Where do I start? Urban villages? No, thank you. Look what's happening in District 9 called an urban village over in where Cambrian Park Plaza is. It's already been uh, been through one developer, bought out by another developer. The plan isn't right. I mean, look at what they did to little Portugal. It was a crime what they did. You know, it's the San Jose way. Get rid of the parking and you're going to bring the customers. Not. You know, I, I like to go to little Portugal and uh, visit uh, my grocer there and a bakery and, and a sausage company. And there's no place to park anymore because the city of San Jose screwed it up. And it was, it was a, a disaster for, for, for months. All this road construction and just awful, awful. I like to go down there. Now there's no place to park. You got to park in front of somebody's house, take up somebody's parking space, residential neighbor. Everybody, the, the city council and this planning commission, you guys are obsessed with either getting rid of parking or making the slot so small, you, it's, it's, it's too big for, the slot is so small, a Hot Wheel doesn't even fit. I mean, it's unbelievable what, what these planning commissions do. You guys have this pie in the sky idea that you're gonna have mass transit, it's gonna be like Europe. It's not gonna be like Europe, we're not Europe. It's never, it, it, it doesn't work that way. You'd have to have such dense housing to be able to do this mass transit. And it's going to be super expensive. And look at what you're doing. You're trying to plan all this stuff during the most inflationary times there are. 
You're not going to be able to afford the building supplies and everything else. Too expensive. And the idea is stupid. It's not going to work. And not only that, you're going to develop little Portugal. What's going to, what's going to happen? The grocer is going to become sprouts. The sausage company is going to become like a yoga studio. Uh, the bakery is going to be vegan. It's going to be CVS, John. Okay, your time is up. Next, we have Viafana. Go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm going to go ahead and promote um, Viafana to panelists um, in order for her to unmute her device. One second. Okay, please go ahead and unmute your device, Viafana. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, I just wanted to do a quick public comment. Uh, love that. I'm sorry, we, we are having a very difficult time hearing you. Jen, let's go to the next speaker, Mr. Viofana, if you could call back in. Hello? Can we hear you now? No, Jen, let's keep let's keep it moving. That concludes all of our speakers. All right, let's give Mr. Viofana one quick chance to get back on. Shouldn't take more than a minute. Is he back on? Um, he yeah. is on the uh, panelist side. You can go ahead and unmute your device. If it does not work, go ahead and dial one of the numbers that are on the screen and enter the meeting ID and you can also join that way. Okay, the call's not come in? No, not, I'm not seeing it come in. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have to keep it moving. All right, so with that, public comment is now closed. We will now give the applicant five minutes to respond to public comment. All I have to say is I, I appreciate all the comments. Um, I think we, we pride ourselves in working with the community. Um, you know, back in April, uh, the Planning Commission unanimously approved our community at 1936 Alum Rock via Del Sol. Uh, we've spent many, 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 many days uh, meeting with the community, hearing them, making changes. Uh, like I've said earlier, uh, we are we're happy to do that again. Um, I think we've made actually a lot of progress in, in the, the meetings we had with RVAC uh, and other members and you know the changes with the rooftop garden I think is beautiful. Um, I want to continue to do more. I think an advisory group moving forward is going to be very helpful for all of us. So um, I'll, I'll leave the extra time to any questions I can field. So with that, then the applicant has concluded his response time. We will now open the floor to questions from commissioners. I am not closing the public hearing. Therefore, the uh, applicant uh, will be available for questions from the commission, but to the applicant, uh, only interject if called upon by myself as chair uh, at the request of a commissioner. Having stated that, colleagues, I know open the floor. Ah, I already see Commissioner Cantrell. Hi, thanks. I, actually, I, I just want to say I, I really, really respect and appreciate all of the comments. Um, and I, I want you guys to know we, we are listening. We hear you. Um, we, we really do. Um, I, I think there are some interesting questions that I have for the developer here that have to do with the parking. Well, I understand that you know the, the restriction is the restriction. I get it. Um, do you think that the lack of parking might have a negative impact on this project in terms of the livability and the desire to live in this location? No, I really. Okay. No, go ahead. Sorry. Is that okay? Just, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, sorry. No, I, I really, we really don't. Um, we wouldn't have designed it that way. Um, we feel that this is the, this is a walkable, this is a car sharing, this is a um, uh, you know uh, utilize utilization of public transit. Um, this is an opportunity to live in housing that's significantly cheaper than market rate housing. This is a major major benefit for these families, and that you know sometimes maybe a little sacrifice has to be done, but. You know, overall, we wouldn't we wouldn't design a community that's not sustainable for the tenants living there. 
Okay, and, and one follow-up question, sure. uh, because it is different for retailers. Um, will you be providing any assigned retail parking spots? Yes, the, the retail, the commercial portion, that is, that is to, to absolute code. There's no concession or reduction in, in uh, commercial parking. That is exactly what's required by code. Thank you. I appreciate your action. No really Thank you. you Thank you, Commissioner Cantrell. Commissioner Lardinois and then Commissioner Ornelas Wise. Thanks. Um, so I also have a question for the developer. Um, so Pacific West was also the developer for the Via del Sol project we had a few months ago, right? Right. Yeah. And I remember in that project, you said um, the plan for the commercial space was to um, you know, rent it out, basically rent free to a nonprofit or some other kind of organization like that. Do you have right. anything similar planned for the commercial space here? Or, and I'm just curious. You know, we, we haven't got that far yet, um, but we do have plenty of space. Um, that's something I, I've, I've actually discussed, um, you know, internally that I think that we need to think about doing something like that too. You know, there's, there's some areas that we can carve out. We have uh, 7,000 square foot split, split up in two spaces. I think that's something we need to think about. But at the end of the day, regardless, we, we're going to have consultations with the Allen Rock Business uh, Association, make sure that what goes in there fits in with the neighborhood and is, an, is a need. So great question. And I assume that means also that you don't have potential tenants lined up at this point. Well, we need to make sure there's a project first. You know, once that happens, we have a, a section within our firm that all they do is deal with the placement of the commercial services and all that fun stuff. And I'm, and I'm di directly involved as well. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Commissioner Ornelas Wise. Hi, um, how are you? Um, I had, of course, some concerns about the parking as well. Um, you know, as as a parent of small kids when you know you have to take the kids to school or pick up groceries and stuff like that so um one of the things that i was really concerned about was uh, pedestrian safety um in regards to i know that james Vick high school is across the way and that some teens might be crossing the street and this might be a question for staff that did the environmental review was there a traffic study done um it, it not so much for the vehicles, but in regards to the increase in pedestrian traffic. Um, of course, my concern, um, because I'm in District 7, that you know I've seen some developments that are affordable housing come up and a lot more fatalities and uh, big intersections. So my concern is safety for the, the community and the families that will be residents at this location. And so uh, I'd like to see some traffic coming measures or something um, to, to ensure the safety of the families and the residents that will be living at this location. That, that's a big, a big concern. So I, I just wanted to ask staff, how are you addressing those safety concerns for especially pedestrians? Of course, I would have liked to see a driveway that was U-shaped because if there's a lot of people that may not have cars, um, I would like to see a safe drop-off and a pickup location on site. Um, that's just, uh, but, but mainly I wanted to know what environmental um, concerns or measures were put in place for, for pedestrian safety. I know Michelle, you worked on the environmental, so. Is anyone uh, on staff, uh, can anyone answer Commissioner Norales Wise's question, please? Hi, uh, this is Tai Chao Lee, uh, Supervising Environmental Planner. Um, so the, as part of the environmental review, we did have a transportation analysis, um, and that does have the local transportation analysis that Commissioner uh, was referring to, which includes uh, information about pedestrian um, and circulation overall with the vehicles. And based on that, we there was no, there was no impact and there was no effects that we would then um, ask the applicant or require them to do anything more than what is currently on the plan right now. Um, at this point, um, I will refer this to Michelle or Tiffany if you have anything else to add, but to answer your questions, the way that the project is designed currently, there's no additional condition that we would add to it because it meets the code. Hi. Uh, is there, uh, oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Michelle Kimball with the Department of Public Works. There was an LTA uh, local transportation analysis that was prepared for this project, um, as Planning had mentioned. Um, and with regard to the project, uh, there is a 
a rapid flashing beacon um, crosswalk, rectangular rapid flashing beacon uh, crosswalk, approximately 500 feet uh, east of this project site that would connect, uh, provide pedestrian connectivity uh, between the project site and uh, James Lake High School. Commissioner, uh, did she answer your question? Yeah, she did. I mean, I, I just, you know, would like to see maybe some post approval monitoring, you know, when projects like this come up to, to ensure that long term, even after the project is approved, that there is some, um, some oversight if later you determine that there is some additional safety measures that need to be in place. Uh, just because like Andrew Hill High School is right here. And, you know, um, I know James Lake is over there. And I know that sometimes, you know, the teens might want to cross, not go all the way to the crosswalk, but cross closer uh, right across the street to, to where they're at. So just, just things to think about. Um, let me see, I, I had some notes here. I know that there will be 23 parking spaces for commercial specifically. And because there is a reduced um, parking for the residents, will at any time or after hours from the commercial, will the residents be allowed to, to park in those 23 spaces uh, or 22 spaces? Is that a condition of any sort um, for staff? From the planning side, that is not a condition. Um, since they are meeting the required parking spaces per the state density bonus law for the residential units and per code for the commercial units. Um, however, uh, we can explore the idea of a shared parking situation between the two uses going forward. Thank you, thank you. Um, another thing, um, I know that um, I'm really glad to see some ground floor commercial space replacing some of what will be lost. Um, I just didn't know if there was some, because I heard some of the community say that they were concerned of, of high vacancy and uh, you know tagging and whatnot. Is there um, another condition that basically states, you know, after X amount of time, uh, you know, how long does a developer have to fill that space or, you know, is there, or convert the use to something else? I, I don't know, maybe if you could speak to that. Good evening, Commissioner. This is Sylvia Doe with Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. Um, from a planning perspective, we don't have any, the city doesn't have any policies per, per se that speak to like a minimum or maximum a leasing period in which a retail space um, needs to be occupied because um, many of that may depend on the market conditions. Um, so it's a little tough for us to regulate it from that sense. Um, however, since Alum Rock is primarily a commercial corridor and uh, we envision this to be a commercial as well as a residential commercial mixed use area, um, given the transportation and transit opportunities, um, that are rich in along Alum Rock. Um, we believe that at some point commercial and mixed use uh, development is really appropriate here. And in time, the right retail or other commercial tenants um, will fill these spaces. Um, in the meantime, uh, should that not happen, certainly there are city um, policies and regulations in place that um, prevent blight and anti-graffiti. Mr. Bavarian, were you going to add to that? I, I see your hand is up. Yeah, you know, I wanted to just address a few things. Um, with regards to the school, we've met with the superintendent and the principal, and they have my contact information. We're gonna continue dialogue and communication moving forward. They're always gonna have my contact information because we are owners. We don't develop and, and sell. We're, gonna, we're there for long-term, we're gonna be their neighbors. Um, and also um, our, we have two onsite managers. So I'm gonna, as soon as those, managers are assigned, I can introduce them to the school, make sure there's a, always an open line of communication. And if things start happening, we can rectify that immediately. And when it comes to the shared parking, um, we can absolutely put, we've done it in many other uh, communities all around that after hours, they absolutely can utilize those spaces. Um, I believe, Laura, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think we did that or doing that um, on 1936 when the but obviously rules have to be put in place whereas 
when that commercial space is open, you, you, the car has to be removed or when it's closed, you know, that's when it's, you, you can, you can share that parking. So rules and, and uh, implementations have to be made, but we're open to doing that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Commissioner. you. Oh, perfect. Commissioner Nalawais, do you have another question? Um, I did uh, agree that maybe there should be an Alamrock uh, corridor design guidelines. I don't know if that already exists. Uh, maybe not now, but, but in the future long-term, um, I think, uh, I know that there was mention of a mural, uh, maybe Darren. And so I didn't know if you had already had a vision for that or if you could show us what that would look like at this point. We don't have any perspectives yet, but we're actually open to the, doing that. Um, I think there's some a few good places that it can be done. Uh, we can work with a local artist to uh, to implement that into the community. We're, we're totally fine with that. I think that'd be actually a great idea. Okay, those, those are all the questions and comments and thank you to staff and, and to everyone for all your hard work. It, it's nice, thank you. I see that Commissioner Lord Denois had his hand up. I don't know if that's a new raise hand or just the previous one that was never put down. My apologies, that's from earlier. Okay, and I see that Commissioner Cantrell has his hand up. Is just, that a new? Just a quick follow up. Of course. Um, so uh, on, the, on the commercial space, I think one of the issues with leasing retail space, especially in communities that are developing, is the cost. Um, I know there's no mandate here, uh, but do you guys generally help make leasehold improvements? Um, what's your process there? It, it depends on the situation. It depends on who is, is coming in. Um, you know, on uh, uh, typically we are, we're building a shell. Um, there are some improvements that are made, you know, flooring, um, um, plumbing things and, you know, all, all the necessary items that are needed to get going. Uh, but again, it just depends on, on who's going to be there and what we're doing. Um, it's hard to say what exactly we're going to be doing here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a little bit different. This is two stories uh, of commercial. So uh, what, you know, initially when this started, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, you know, you're thinking offices on the second story. Uh, but now, Probably not. Uh, maybe a restaurant. Maybe you know. Maybe a, a market. Uh, we don't know yet. So it really just depends on who's coming in. It's a case to case. I think the concerns in the community are are, are interesting, and in, in the fact that you know we we live in communities because of the things around us, uh, and you know we we'd love to see opportunity for legacy build businesses in these communities to grow and expand into these great spaces. Um, you know, that I think the community has a right to be concerned that, you know, if your sausage maker becomes a, a yoga studio, uh, <laughs> it changes the, the vibrancy of the community. And I, I hope you reflect on that. I, I can see that you guys seem very amenable to, to making this work for the community. I hope you'd listen to those concerns as well. Absolutely. Commissioner Garcia, thank you, Commissioner Kinchel. I'm sorry, do you have any other questions, Commissioner? Okay, Commissioner Garcia. Uh, thank you, Chair Bonilla. This is not a question, just more of a comment. And, you know, I applaud the community for bringing their concerns to the table. I applaud the developer for listening and having an open mind. I really like this project. It seems very well done. Um, I'm a big fan of, of the mixed use. Uh, you know, it's, you know, you hear the concerns about wanting retail, uh, about the current uh, crisis of affordable housing and the current state of that corridor right there in Alam Rock. And the quickest way to keep it the way it is, is to make it too difficult on developers to develop projects in this area and put overdue influence, you know, in, in demands, if you will. I mean, it's 100% affordable housing. If it weren't, we'd be asking to give some and they've already made the whole thing affordable housing. Uh, it has the commercial element and uh, there's no, you know, they, they still need the project approved before it can be um, leased. You know, as you said, I remember occupying uh, the space down the street where Chase was the floor tenant in a mixed use building and Chase is no longer there because the branch was dead, right? So 
the way we can gravitate more retail to that space is uh, to that area is is by projects like this. I, you know, I remember when there was um, a thriving orchard supply there down the street, uh, uh, Reed's Bicycle Shop and Gun, uh, gun Shop. It, it was a great place to shop and they're gone. So, I mean, we need to bring these type of developments back. Um, it's, it's, it's a well done project. And um, I thank the developer for having, you know, the open uh, mind to listen to the concerns of the community and, and working to satisfy, you know, what, what's feasible. But, um, you know, th thank you to the developer and thank you to the community for having their, their concerns uh, voiced because they are heard. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Commissioner Torrance. Did Commissioner Torrance just fall off the meeting? Oh, here I am. Oh, there you go, there you, go, there you go. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. That's like magic, right? Magic. <laughs> okay, let me, let me just start over. So quick, quick, one question and a couple of comments. Uh, my question, you talked about the services that you'll be providing in this project. Uh, where will those take place and who will be providing them? So they will be taking place on site uh, in a com community area and they will be held by a company called Life Steps. And Life Steps is licensed and qualified through uh, the Affordable Housing Tax California Tax Credit Allocation Committee. Um, and this is all they do and they do it all over the state and they're fantastic. And so how is that funded? Through us, through the actual project funds it. It's it built into our operating budget. Okay. And so you have other, they're up and operating these in other places. Can you give yes. an example like that I could check out just for? If you time? look, actually look their website up. I mean, they're probably, I would say they're in hundreds of different affordable housing projects uh, conducting services. Um, if you look at the majority of ours, of our on our website, um, there chances are they're on, they're they're doing doing the services there, uh, but they're, I would say over a hundred different affordable housing projects they're they're conducting services on. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have have listened to the community tonight, to uh, the council member from the area, from my colleagues, uh, the developer staff. And I feel 100% confident that this is a great project. Um, the affordability, the due diligence has been done. Um, and so I would like to make a motion to approve staff recommendations. Second. Before we've got a first and a second. Having said that, I'd like the opportunity to say something for sure. So uh, before we all, okay, I, will, I will go ahead. So let me begin by saying, uh, number one, to the developer, I do want to recognize that he has been extremely open to meeting with the community. And I will disclose I was at two community meetings where the developer was there and I'm at the point where I think I've, uh, I've, I've gotten his script down by memory uh, because of, uh, he's, he's given it and he's had these conversations. My, my issue, and let me also start this on a personal note before folks think that this is ideological. It's, it's, it's not. I understand the plight of being homeless uh, because a little known fact about me, when I was in high school, I lost my place to live. Our parents, we lost our place to live and we had nowhere to live. We were, it was a rough situation. So I understand firsthand a lot of the trauma and, and, and a lot of the uncertainty and, and, and really that sense of not, you feel like you're from everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. And, and, and somehow I got here, but I, I know a lot of friends along the way uh, with similar fact patterns that were not as fortunate as I. And, and I know for a fact that a stable place to call home would have made a difference. Having said that, as I've said from the very beginning of my term here, the fundamental question is, is it reasonable to expect for one side of the city, as was reported last week, for example, on San Jose Spotlight, to carry a disproportionate share of the affordable housing that San Jose needs. We all agree, affordable housing is critical, it is necessary, but is it fair for East San Jose to carry the brunt of that? I drive up and down this corridor every day. I know what this is going to be. 
I, I, I know about the parking issues, the traffic issues. We have those already. It takes me about 40 minutes to get from Jackson and, and Alam Rock all the way to South White, about 30, 40 minutes. It takes me just as long to get from my home to East Palo Alto, believe it or not. So for me, that is the question. And I think with Mr. Haro and Ms. Barosio said earlier, the issue I also have is the fact that, you know, the city talks about a plan for this part of the city and that they are working on this being the third village. Having said that, the approval of projects and, and buildings is already happening. We have this project here before us. There's another project that may be SB 35 right next to it. Uh, right next to this project, there is a property for sale for roughly about $2 million. Highly likely that similar type of project will be proposed for that site. At what point do we as a city, as a commission, and eventually as a council say to ourselves, hold on for just a minute. You know, we need a plan for this area because the very things we're trying to avoid and to fix, you know, this uncertainty, these pressures, we're actually enhancing. Because the reality is, as it is today, East San Jose, and I think the, the esteemed council member has said this publicly, I have as well, is already under-resourced. So when we continue to put more of this housing, or of this housing that creates additional pressures into this community, are we truly making the situation better for everyone? Or, are we, or is this a bit of a Faustian bargain where we feel good about ourselves for doing it? And I understand it is a good thing. Let me say that again. It is a good thing to provide affordable housing. But the question is, is it fair for one side of the city to carry an extraordinary amount of it? So for that reason, I will be voting no. Uh, having said that, uh, again, I, I can't stress this enough. Uh, the future of East San Jose, in my mind, is going to be determined within the next four to five years. The decisions that we make today will, de will decide whether we are going to continue on this plateau that we've been in for about 40 years, or if we're actually ever going to ignite and be the district that, that you know, someone said it best earlier, that we are the, the stepchild to the rest of the city. We are. So having said all that, I respect my colleagues, I respect their opinion, uh, but I do want to make it very clear that my concern is stems from the idea that in my mind, it is truly not, it is not appropriate for one side of the city to carry all this. Having said that though, I do appreciate your comments. I do appreciate your opinions. Uh, Mr. Kelly, it looks like you have something to say. So with that, I will let you speak and then I will call for a vote. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a quick clarification uh, we want to make or noting on the plans that the rooftop deck uh, elevation is shown as an option. And the, uh, there's a separate uh, floor plan for floor six that does not include the roof deck. And I think it is the applicant's intent to include the, the roof deck. And so I just wanted to uh, maybe ask the applicant through the chair to clarify that it is uh, the applicant's intent to provide that roof deck. And if so, um, then staff would be recommending a condition of approval that would state um, that Let's see, find it here. Basically stating that the rooftop deck option shown on sheet 2.1A of the plans shall be implemented. Are you, are you asking the applicant that question? Yes, I just threw, threw the chair since I don't think it's- Oh, yes, good. Mr. Thank you, yep. Mr. Barbarian, please answer the question. Yes, that's our intent. And that's okay. fine with the condition. Okay, then, then staff's recommendation is to uh, take the action listed on the staff report with that added condition. Thank you. And so there is a motion on the floor um, and let's ask the maker of the motion and the seconder if they will include that additional condition of approval in their motion. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brillo, you had a question or comment? I, I do actually, look, actually, can you clarify what the uh, added what was added to the motion? I didn't hear that. I will. I will defer to Vera. <laughs> okay. Or Mr. So the, Actually, Pat, if you could go for it because yeah, you read it sure. into the record, yeah. we can um, get it from there as well. The condition of approval is that the rooftop deck option shown on sheet two point one A of the plans shall be implemented. Okay. And um, 
and yes, yeah, so I don't have a question. Jackie Morales Ferrand, our housing director, would like to speak. So I'd like to turn it over to her. She, I think she's she's an attendee. She's in the attendee box, not the panelist box. Are we giving her the chance to speak, Jennifer? Yes. Okay. There you go. Jackie? Yes, great. Hi, I'm Jackie Morales Grand. I am the Director of Housing. And I just wanted to note that the City of San Jose is working on an affordable housing uh, plan that looks at where our affordable housing is distributed. And I have to say that there is nowhere in the city of San Jose where we have too much affordable housing. The need is so great in all of the districts for affordable housing. And it would not be unusual that you see something like here in this quarter, um, as we're beginning to see redevelopment happening, that affordable housing would go in first, but there are plenty of opportunities for market rate housing uh, to follow the affordable as the rents increase in the in the area. And so often affordable housing goes in first uh, and would really protect many of the interests um, and the residents who are there to, to be able to remain in the housing. Um, the, the one last thing that I would just add um, is that this particular project is is has yet to apply for any city funding. I, be, I believe they will be going forward without the city of San Jose's investment. And so it's going to result in the higher end of affordability. So this is not going to include permanent supportive housing, uh, which is the extremely low income. It's really going to be, frankly, balancing some of the other affordable housing that we've been seeing in the district that has uh, a lot of the extremely low income housing. So um, I'm available if you have any more questions about the affordable housing piece. Thank, Thank you. you. At, at this point, I will call for the question. So we are ready to vote. We have a floor, uh, a motion and a second. So I will go first. Bonilla, no. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Oh, I have to. Is that a thumbs up anywhere? She's right, got a thumbs up. That's a yes. Cantrell? <laughs> Uh, first chair, I'd like to say that I really appreciate your remarks. Uh, it, it, it means a lot, and I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, I'm voting yes on this one. Perfect. Garcia? Yes, in favor. Lorda Noir? Lorda Noir? And then I go for said yes. Okay. One thing, yes. Oh, that's right. It's not here. Oliverio. Yes. Bernalas Wise. Yes. Torrance. Yes. Young. Yes. All right. With that, the motion passes 9 1 with one absent. And this, this wasn't even the big one. We have a couple more big items up tonight. <laughs> Okay, with that, I am ready to move on to item 5A, PP21-011. Staff, do we have a presentation? Thank you, Chair. Uh, we do have a presentation today. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Thank you all. Aparna Ankola from the Policy and Ordinance Team Planning Department. The item before you is a proposed amendment to Title 20 of the San Jose Municipal Code, also known as the Zoning Code. Staff routinely updates the zoning provisions to also include technical and formatting edits to ensure consistency with other sections of the code. This proposed update will rectify typographical errors, include clarifying edits, and incorporate text from a prior approval. Staff proposes to amend specific items in Chapter 20.30, Residential Districts, 20.40, Commercial Districts, 
20.50 industrial districts, 20.70 downtown zoning district, and 20.90 parking and loading. Staff would like to add that items two and three will only incorporate previously approved text with no additional changes. The changes addressed in chapter 20.30 will rectify a typographical error and also make clarifying sections changes to residential zoning districts. The dash that denotes not permitted was inadvertently included in table 20-50 in addition to the S, which indicates special use permit requirement. This update will delete the dash and rectify this error. The remaining items proposed for residential zoning districts clarify the rear corner lot setback and make changes to the accessory buildings and structures section for consistency. Staff is proposing two changes related to setback line along the corner neighboring lot and the reference to single story to reconcile and conform with current code provisions. The existing reference to the attached building line in section 20.30.270 is required to match the front setback of a neighboring lot, which is typically 20 feet. However, any accessory building or structure located along the site, lot site, typically requires a setback of 10 feet. With recent state law provisions, staff would like to add that we have incorporated updates for structures located in the rear yard for single family lots. This also includes accessory dwelling units or ADUs. For instance, a new attached ADU would require a minimum setback of four feet along rear and side yard and a maximum height of 20 feet in height for any single story portion. However, the corner side setback is retained at 10 feet. In order to make this requirement consistent with more recent updates, staff recommends that the corner lot distance should match the minimum driveway length requirement of 18 feet in accordance with section 20.90.130. So the reduction is from the original 20 feet to 18 feet. And the reason we would like to include the 18 feet is if this minimum driveway distance is modified based on any future updates, it would still remain consistent with other code sections, including the height requirements. Note five in section 20.3.500 is a cross-reference to height exceptions for solar photovoltaic system for accessory buildings and structures, such as detached garages, gazebos, or sheds. However, the same requirements are replicated in section 20.30.530 as well. Staff proposes to consolidate the height exception requirement for solar photovoltaic systems within one single section and to incorporate the term structures along with accessory buildings in the revised section 20.30.530. I would like to note that this is consistent with the deleted note five. There are no changes to the existing and proposed height of structures or requirements as indicated in this illustration. As indicated earlier, items two and three, the commercial and industrial zoning districts will reinsert approved text back into the zoning code in accordance with ordinance 30372 that inadvertently was not published. No additional changes are proposed in this section except for the insertion of previously approved text. Staff recommends replacing the term movie theater, the term indoor theater in the downtown zoning district to maintain consistency with the same reference used elsewhere in the zoning ordinance, including the commercial zoning districts. The specific item be replaced with a more generic and consistent reference that would encompass the movie theater use as well. Table 20-190 refers to parking spaces required by land use in section 20.90.220. 
this table title was listed as 20-19 error. Proposed update rectifies this typographical error. No additional changes are proposed to this parking and loading section. This concludes the presentation and staff is available for any questions. Do we have any uh, public comment, Jen? No raised hands at this time and no requests. Okay. Time. All right. So with that, we will go to commissioner questions. Let me be the first to start, although it's a bit out of order here. But let me just say thank you, Aparna, Aparna for your due diligence in this presentation. I found it very helpful. Uh, I know this was uh, important to me, particularly with a new body. And I think the presentation is summed it all up perfectly and put it in a manner that's digestible and understandable, not only to us, actually, uh, but to the general public, uh, because everything we do impacts them directly. So I do want to thank you for that. That is the extent of my comments. The, the Commissioner Cantrell, you have a question there, Commissioner Cantrell. A simple, maybe funny question is the the uh, the change of notation to indoor theater begs the question of whether or not there's regulation for outdoor theater, and, and if that's included anywhere. That's a great point, Commissioner Cantrell. <laughs> Does anyone? Have an answer I can to that question. respond to that. I'm Martina Davis, uh, acting division manager for the citywide planning team. Um, <clears throat> there is actually in outdoor theater is a separately listed use. So it, it is there already and it, it's just separately listed. It has its own category. So this wouldn't affect anything having to do with outdoor, th or out outdoor theaters. That, that explains the specific language change. <laughs> thank you. Commissioner Young. Thank you, Commissioner Cantrell. Commissioner Young. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Parna. That was a really, really great um, presentation. I really appreciate it. it. Had a lot of detail. And I'd also like to thank you, Chair Benia, for um, actually pulling this off the consent calendar. I, I think uh, there's a lot of detail, but I think it's important for us as commissioners to understand um, what we're voting on and not just uh, you know blanketly approve things that maybe we don't understand and i know that i didn't understand it at the last meeting so thank you for that i'm going to make a motion at this time that we approve the staff recommendation do we have second. a oh we had a race for that one so <laughs> I, someone's have to help me commissioner young with the motion who is the second second torrens torrens all right torrens so commissioner young with the motion torrens with the second i will now go ahead and take does anyone else have anything to say for the good of the order or are we okay? Okay, Commissioner. Uh, Chair, one question, Chair. Yes, sir. Um, I guess a question for the body, the Planning Commission itself. Would you prefer this is way staff present items such as this in the future? That's a, that's a great question, Commissioner Oliverio. I found it extremely helpful. Uh, we don't have the benefit of being there in person and I mean, if you recall, Commissioner Oliveri, when, when I was first appointed, I, I was sitting to your to your left. And even there were times where I would lean in and ask a question and we'd have that back and forth. I think it's a particular importance when we don't have that opportunity to really kind of come together as a group. That is my opinion. I, I will, for the record, state I, I made an assumption. The vote reflected a, 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 a support of that assumption, but it is a fair question. I will allow for my colleagues to, to, to respond to that. I, but before we do that, Commissioner Ellis Wise, you had a you had a question. Then we'll go to Commissioner. Actually, you know, let's take, let's get to Commissioner Liberio's question first. Does anyone else have any quick thoughts on that? Actually, uh, I, I was actually going to make that same comment. I think that was enormously clarifying, and I feel confident in the decision I'm, I'm going to make today. Perfect. Okay, Commissioner Ornelas Wise. I agree, and I thank staff for clarifying. I, there was a lot of uh, minor edits there. I mean, I know that they seem to be pretty technical, but there was a lot of talk about exceptions to the rule. And when there's exceptions to the rule, you want to make sure that they're easier for uh, you know the homeowner, right? So I just wanted to make sure we weren't making it harder, and we were continuing to, that the exception stayed in place, uh, or in fact were improved. So um, thank you, and I do agree that. Um, for the public, it should should be clarified and, and for the Planning Commission as well. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Torrance, your hand is up. Are you wanting to comment again or? Yeah. Okay, go yes. ahead. Yes, 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just was responding to Commissioner Oliverio's question. Is this how we want this going forward? And I say yes. It didn't take that long to uh, to have that presentation and for us to have clarity. So I do think it's a good way to present that to us. That's great. Well, that's happy to hear. Uh, it's always good when we have clarity. So with that, I will go ahead and call for the vote. Uh, Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero, can someone help me with the thumbs up? Thumbs up. Yes, yes. Thumbs up. All right. Caballero, yes. Cantrell? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Ardenois? Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Cordelas Wise? Yes. Torrance? Yes. And Young? Yes. All right. The item passes. So we will now go ahead and open item six, open the general plan hearing 2021 cycle two. Are there, any, there are no items for the general plan consent. I'm sorry, Commissioner Nellis Weiss, did you have a question? Oh, I didn't know if this was in, this is not item eight, uh, A, is it for general plan? No, I was about okay. to get to that actually. Okay. I was about to get okay. to that, yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so we will now move to item eight, general plan public hearing. Jen, how many folks do we have for public? Uh, it looks like we have a large crowd for that item. And I also understand that Commissioner Ornelas Wise uh, has a conflict, correct? That's correct. So before we hunker down for the rest of the night and also to give Commissioner Ornelas Wise the time to, uh, to step away from the meeting, uh, I'm going to suggest we take a quick five minute break, glass of water, run to the restroom. And why don't we reconvene at 8.06 p.m. And then by then, Commissioner Ornelas Weiss, you do not have to come back to the, to the meeting. Okay. Well, for this portion of the meeting. <laughs> Everyone okay with that? And if I, if I may, before we recess, um, there was some information that, uh, or a meeting that um, Committee for Green Foothills, I believe a couple of months ago had on um, Coyote Valley. And I know no council members or commissioners attended, but you were also given the opportunity to view that meeting, um, that informational meeting, be, if you desired. In the event that you did, recall that council policy requires you to disclose that on the record um, for that item. And also, um, if you've had any other communications with anyone regarding that item, um, that you need to disclose that on the record. Thank you. All right, so do we have any conflicts to disclose on the record at the moment? Well, they're not conflicts, it's just information oh, sorry. received correct. outside correct. of the hearing process. Okay, so with that, we will reconvene at Chair, sure. One second, I think yes. uh, Commissioner Ornelas Wise, is she, Vera, is she supposed to state her conflict before she? <laughs> I can do that, I spoke to her and I don't know if she's still there. Um, it's not a conflict of interest under state law, but her father-in-law owns a property that is affected by this general plan amendment. And so it is a matter of an appearance of bias under council policy, and that is her reason for abstaining. Perfect, thank you for that. Okay, with that, we will go ahead and take a five minute recess. See you all at 8.08 p.m.
public hearing. And we will begin with a staff presentation. All right, general plan for year review, Coyote Valley. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Chair, Commissioners, Robert Rivera with the Planning Division. GP21012, GPT21002, C21031, PDC21033, and PP21012 are projects related to the general plan four year and specifically Coyote Valley. On the agenda tonight, I have a brief presentation on the four year review and City Council approved scope and background and long term future of Coyote Valley. I want to note that the county planning staff will also be providing information for agenda item four on Coyote Valley. That'll be followed by an overview of task force discussion and staff and task force recommendations and public outreach. General plan four year review and city council approved scope. The Envision San Jose 2040 general plan is a comprehensive, innovative and forward thinking policy document that lays the framework for becoming a fiscally sound and environmentally sustainable city of great places. Over 5,000 individuals participated in the general plan update process from 2008 through 2011. And the general plan was approved unanimously by city council on November 1st, 2011. The general plan sets forth goals and policies requiring the city to conduct a review of the plan every four years. The purpose of the general plan four year review is to evaluate significant changes in the planning context and achievement of key general plan goals. The general plan requires the city to reconvene a task force during each four year review to provide community and stakeholder engagement in reviewing and evaluating success in the implementation of the general plan and to recommend any mid course actions needed to achieve its goals. Based on the outcome and recommendations from the four year review task force process, the city council could decide to amend the general plan goals, policies and actions and or the land use transportation diagram to further the achievement of the general plans visions and major strategies. The task force was reconvened by the mayor's office and included both new appointees and appointees who participated on the task force that guided the development of the Envision San Jose 2040 um, general plan between 2007 and 2011. The 40 member task force included former and current council members and representatives from affordable housing, environmental, labor, religious, and community organizations. The task force also included representatives from the development community, the planning commission, and representatives selected by each council member. Uh, Teresa Alvarado and David Pandori served as co chairs for the task force. On June 11, 2019, the City Council approved the staff recommended scope of work for the second general plan four year review and provided additional scope of scope items as detailed in a memo issued by Mayor San Ricardo, Council Member Sergio Jimenez, Council Member Raul Porales, and Council Member Sylvia Arenas on June 7, 2019. Going over the scope, the scope for urban villages includes a redistribution of plan growth and urban village boundary modifications. This work item also includes exploring adjustments for urban village boundaries and or potentially in removing certain urban villages or adding new urban villages. Allowing mixed income housing within mixed use developments with a significant percentage of restricted affordable housing, affordable homes to proceed within an urban village plan ahead of a growth horizon, modifications to urban village growth horizons, um, modifications to the residential pool capacity, capacity and modifications of general plan policy IP 5-1 and IP 5-10. The scope for housing includes opportunity housing to explore adding, allowing 20 or two to four units per parcel on single family parcels, explore allowing limited housing in neighborhood business districts and explore a change to commercial space requirements for affordable housing. Scope related to residential and employment capacities include potential redistribution of planned job growth from North Coyote Valley and discussion on the long-term future of North Coyote Valley and Mid Coyote Urban Reserve and shifting plan residential capacity to downtown. 
And then scope related to other policies include consideration of moving to tier two policies of the general plan to support VMT reduction and reworking the Evergreen East Hills development policy. Tonight, we'll be hearing background and recommendations related to Coyote Valley and all other general plan four year review items will be scheduled for November 10th and property housing for December 1st. So the scope for Coyote Valley, specifically the scope of work approved by city council was to analyze potential redistribution of planned jobs from North Coyote Valley and potential effects upon the city that could result from the loss of employment lands. Additionally, the staff and the task force are tasked with considering the long-term future of Coyote Valley to achieve objectives such as preservation of open space and habitat, flood and groundwater protection, agriculture, climate change resiliency, and passive recreation. Some brief background in the long-term future of Coyote Valley. Um, the brief overview of the Coyote Valley planning area and the general plan's existing land use designation. Coyote Valley is located in the southern reaches of San Jose and is broken up into three distinct planning areas in the general plan, covering a total of 7,000 acres. North Coyote Valley in blue is designated as an employment growth area for industrial park uses Existing uses are primarily agriculture with the exception of the IBM Silicon Valley Lab, Gavilan College Public Safety Training Center, and Metcalf Energy Center. Mid Coyote Valley is designated as an urban reserve not to be developed within the time frame of the general plan. Mid Coyote is outside of the city's urban service area and is the predominant and the predominant land use is agriculture, although there are some commercial, industrial, and residential uses as well. The South Coyote Valley Greenbelt is located outside the city's urban growth area, urban growth boundary, and is the most developed and parcelized planning area. It includes a mix of residential, agriculture, and other uses such as Coyote Creek Golf Club. Planning Coyote Valley has been an important component of the city's general plan since the 1960s. In fact, the city's first general plan designated north and parts of South Coyote Valley for industrial uses and other areas for residential uses. This changed with General Plan 75, which designated most of Coyote Valley for agriculture and limited low density residential. But this changed again in the 80s with the Horizon 2000 General Plan, which designated North Coyote Valley for industrial uses and established the Urban Reserve and South Coyote Greenbelt that we know today. The San Jose 2020 general plan adopted in 1994 established the urban growth boundary and in 2002 in response to development interests spurred from the dot com boom. The city council initiated a specific plan process to prepare a plan to develop 50,000 jobs and 25,000 housing units in North and Mid Coyote. The, the specific plan effort ended in 2008 and was ultimately never completed and consideration of development in Coyote Valley was deferred to the Envision San Jose 2040 general comprehensive update. Uh, the result was that North Coyote was maintained as an employment growth area. The urban reserve was left in place, but not planned for development through 2040. And the green belt was maintained as a permanent non-urban buffer between San Jose and Morgan Hill. Staff and the task force have been tasked with revisiting this topic and staff is proposing a new vision for Coyote Valley based on changes in planning context and natural and agricultural resources in the valley. Since adoption of the general plan in 2011, there have been a handful of key changes in planning context related to Coyote Valley. The most significant of which is measure T a $650 million disaster preparedness, public safety, and infrastructure bond passed by San Jose voters in 2018, which allocated $50 million for acquisition of land associated with water quality and flood protection. In 2019, using Measure T funds, the City Council approved a $96 million purchase with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority and the Peninsula, Peninsula Open Space Trust of 937 acres in North Coyote Valley to create a natural preserve. Excluding properties already developed with urban uses, 
This effectively leaves approximately 314 acres of remaining developable lands with an industrial park designation, which is shown on the map. Uh, the hash is uh, purchased by POST and OSA, and the remaining is highlighted in blue. Two other key actions taken by City Council are, ado are adoption of Climate Smart San Jose and City Council Policy 5-1, both approved in February 2018. Climate Smart San Jose is a plan that charts a path for reducing carbon emissions in San Jose in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. One of the strategies in the plan is creating jobs in San Jose that are transit accessible, which can reduce the need for commuter car trips. City Council Policy 5-1, establishes vehicle miles traveled, known as VMT, as a primary metric for evaluating transportation impacts of new development projects under CEQA. Coyote Valley is at the southern end of San Jose, lacks transportation options, and has the highest VMT in the city for jobs and housing. Another important plan adopted in 2018 by the County Board of Supervisors was the Santa Clara Valley Agriculture Plan, whose Purpose is to protect agriculture land as a long-term resource and minimize the impacts of climate change. The plan identifies as an agriculture resource area for the county, including Mid and South Coyote Valley, and lays out strategies to support agriculture and the agriculture industry. Some of the actions include creating consistency in the, de the designation of agriculture areas between the county and the cities and alignment of general plan policies around agriculture. Other strategies include preventing the establishment of incompatible uses to agriculture and prevention of the conversion of ag lands into rural ranchettes. Other policy items to highlight are Plan Bay Area 2040, adopted in 2017, which is a state mandated transportation and land use plan developed by MTC and ABAG, which looks at how the Bay Area region will grow and identify strategies focused on creating a more sustainable and equitable future for the region. In the Plan Bay area, most of Coyote Valley is located with, within priority conservation areas, which are areas identified as regionally significant open space. State Assembly Bill 948, authored by Assembly Member Ash Calbra, was signed into law in 2019 and designates over 17,000 acres in Coyote Valley, including North, Mid, and South, as a resource of statewide significance. Also, recently Governor Newsom issued executive, executive order N8220, which established a goal for conserving 30% of the state's natural and working lands, which is supported by the recent purchase of lands in North Coyote by the city, OSA, and Post. Speaking to natural resources in Coyote Valley, Studies have documented the ecological value of the area for rare and endangered species, and Coyote Valley has been identified as a top priority for regional conservation efforts, particularly because it's the last intact valley floor connection between Santa Cruz Mountain and Diablo Mountain Range. The general plan recognizes this and includes goals and policies to minimize adverse effects of development on wildlife movement. Coyote Valley also accounts for almost 50% of undeveloped aquifer recharge areas for Silicon Valley. And based on studies by Santa Clara Valley Water District, it's highly vulnerable to contaminant releases due to shallow groundwater death and high permeability. Similar to wildlife linkages, the general plan includes policies to protect groundwater by discouraging the location of new development with the potential to impact groundwater quality in areas identified as having high degree of aquifer vulnerability by valley water. In addition to natural resources, Coyote Valley is also known for agriculture resources. Much of the valley is classified as farmland of statewide importance and having class one soils, which is the most productive soils for agriculture. Major crops today include hay, Asian vegetables, mushrooms, and walnuts. Some of the primary challenges to farming, not just in Coyote Valley, but overall in the county, include rural ranchettes, large numbers of small lots, labor challenges, incompatible uses, and land held for speculation, which is when owners of agriculture properties don't use or lease their land for agriculture, or if they do lease the land for farming, it's for uses that have no long-term investment, like hay farming. 
The general plan recognizes these resources and includes goals and policies to protect agriculture lands to facilitate production and provide access to local foods, as well as to promote environmental, fiscal, and economic benefits of rural agriculture lands. To offer some more context around agriculture and provide information on policy and program work going on at the county level, I'd like to introduce Michael Meeham, Senior Planner with the County Department of Planning and Development. I'll stop sharing my screen. He has a brief presentation as well. Thank you, Robert. Let me pull up my screen here. And how's that working? Not, not working yet. It's blank. It says Michael Meehan has started screen sharing, but it's nothing is up. Still nothing. Nothing. <laughs> if you have two desktops, you might want to drag the other desktop over into the screen. Say that one more time. If you have two desktops, you might want to drag the, that desktop with your power your slides over into this screen. Well, aside from audio, my uh, screen is in fact okay. frozen. Oh. <laughs> so I can't do much. You um, hate to do this again, but I don't mind because I don't want to have you on the spot. Let's, let's give you about three. Oh, there it is. I'm going to try this one more time. That worked a second ago. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Oh, that was working? Yeah. OK. Let's try that. And how about now? There we go. Perfect. All right. Good evening. Uh, Michael Meehan, as introduced by Robert, Senior Planner with the Department of Planning and Development in the County of Santa Clara. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners, for the opportunity to make a presentation uh, on the county's work related to today's item on the future of Coyote Valley. More specifically, I'll be focusing on the subject of agricultural preservation and viability in Coyote Valley. So for the county's backdrop, uh, the issues being discussed today really starts and ends with our general plan, which for over 40 years now has called for the preservation of Coyote Valley as an agricultural greenbelt area between two growing cities. In the unincorporated areas of Coyote Valley, the zoning has long been our most restrictive exclusive ag zoning with 40 acre lot minimums to the north and 20 acre lot minimums to the south. In 2018, the county's efforts to preserve ag lands and the economic viability of farms and ranches significantly ramped up, as Robert discussed through the development and passage of the Santa Clara Valley Ag Plan. For seven months in 2018, our Agricultural Preservation Task Force meant monthly to consider the challenges and opportunities facing our ag sector. This task force included two members of the County Board of Supervisors, our county executive and a diversity of community stakeholders, including one farmer in Coyote Valley. In 2019, the County Board of Supervisors adopted a bundle of recommendations, which ha we have been uh, busy implementing since, and I'll get into some of these a bit more later on. In 2020, the uh, Santa Clara County Food Systems Alliance prepared a robust, a robust follow-up to the Ag Plan, focusing specifically on the challenges and opportunities facing operations on smaller parcels in the county. We're also in the midst of an update to our general plan and zoning ordinance that would create an overlay zone in Coyote Valley focusing on ag and climate resilience. This overlay will act as a precursor for a more comprehensive suite of updates to our rural zoning and the general plan as a whole. The rural zoning update is also underway and we're expecting to kick off our big general plan update in earnest next year. 
In short, the city staff recommendations today come at an opportune moment and synergize with the county's long-term planning for the ag lands of Coyote Valley. So importantly, the county's more recent work to preserve ag lands and their economic viability is rooted in an interest first to mitigate and adapt to our region's climate change impacts. The funding for much of our policy and preservation work thus far has come from the state's greenhouse gas reduction fund generated through cap and trade auctions, which comes with an explicit nexus to reduce sprawl development and the emissions from increased vehicle miles that result. Analysis as part of uh, our ag plan found that specific to Santa Clara County, one acre of farmland will on average produce 77 times fewer emissions than the most likely conversion to development. This dramatic difference is by and large the result of the increased traffic. And lastly, the county's current work aims to amplify and incentivize the co-benefits of farming, specifically the ecosystem services provided by working lands like atmospheric carbon sequestration, flood and wildfire mitigation, and aquifer uh, recharge. All the county's planning efforts have in the last five years taken a keen interest in the climate benefits associated with the retention uh, of our peri-urban farmland, it quickly became clear that the overall question of farming viability was going to be a critical component to our research and planning. Over several years of research and focus on this topic, county staff have repeatedly heard from property owners that ag is dead in Santa Clara, in Santa Clara Valley. And yet over the course of hundreds of hours of farmer roundtables, technical advisory panels, task force meetings, and public outreach, county staff have also heard from ranchers and farmers who tell a different story in which the primary obstacle to agricultural viability is stable access to the land and the lack of stability and investment in ag properties. Most farmers in the area do not own land but lease it and this is primarily their story. Most farmers in the valley have year-to-year -year leases and as land insecure tenants can't rationalize making much of any improvements on this kind of timeline, let alone expand their business operations uh, at all. Property owners also can't rationalize these ag investments if their goal is land bank banking and speculation for future development. This dynamic leads to an underinvestment in and maintenance of the basic infrastructure necessary to farm, like ag wells and barns. If the well is no longer in use and there's no place for a tractor or for packing produce, a farmer is left with extremely limited options, namely dry farming hay. What, what county staff has found was that decades of land use uncertainty, land speculation, and underinvestment in the ag properties of the area, most especially Coyote Valley, have hindered access to the productive use of this prime farmland. And this was especially the case for new and immigrant farmers who face even greater challenges to accessing farmland. The Ag Plan and the Small Farms Report each found that preservation and land access were the fundamental barriers to the sustained economic viability of farmland in our county. The specter of development has long resulted in these short-term farm leases, which results in instability and disincentivizes investment or innovation in our ag businesses. Many of the farmers that we spoke with as part of these two studies stated clearly that their chief obstacle uh, uh, to succeeding was secure access to land that was being held as a long-term investment and leased out to farmers for only years or even months at a time. Our research made clear uh, that farming is hard and there are many barriers to success, some of which we've targeted through the implementation of the Ag Plan. So to date, we have piloted an agricultural conservation easement program, an agricultural resilience incentive grant program, which funds carbon farming practices, permit streamlining and expanded options for ag employee housing. We are currently undertaking the creation of a farmland security zone program and updates to our Williamson Act guidelines, which dramatically reduce property taxes and a significant update to rural zoning that will align with city staff's recommendations here tonight, including uh, significant streamlining for the development of all ag supportive uses. Lastly, we are in the process of hiring a full-time permanent position whose role will be to serve as an agricultural liaison, helping farmers and ranchers to access resources and overcome regulatory hurdles. I encourage all 
who are interested in this topic to peruse these reports that have summarized our collective research. And I encourage you to learn more about some of the farmers we connected with, in particular, those individuals whose voices are often missing from these conversations. The newer and smaller farms, the immigrant and beginning operations, um, folks that are often uncomfortable or simply too busy to participate. I also want to highlight some farms that are perhaps relevant to tonight's consideration uh, about the future of Coyote Valley. First, Spade and Plow, a relatively new and quickly growing family operation offering CSA vegetable boxes and farmers market stands to the residents of San Jose and the larger Bay Area. This family has long struggled with land security and it's been the biggest obstacle to their business expanding. For the last several years, Spade and Plow has been oversubscribed with dozens of families on a waiting list for just the opportunity to purchase their produce on a weekly basis. While they at one time aspired to move north to Coyote Valley from their location in San Martin to be closer to their customer base, they instead went south to a Gilroy property that had already been protected with a conservation easement and therefore offered more security of tenure. Next, Frontoyo Grove, a 96 acre property acquired and fully subdivided for the purpose of developing 19 rural residential estates. However, instead, the owner began growing a unique varietal of olives at the front of the property, built out his own olive press and began winning foodie awards for his olive oil and stocking boutique groceries throughout the Bay Area. Last year, he sold the development rights to all but one of the 19 planned homes and with the funding from his conservation easement, he will now be expanding his olive orchard across the full 96 acres and developing his olive oil press building uh, to also host a public facing shop or tasting room. Now, uh, looking north to Mid Coyote Valley, I wanna direct your attention to three particular adjacent parcels, a walnut orchard, a hayfield, and an Asian vegetable farm. First, the hayfield. These 60 acres have been held for decades by an investment company. And like many of the properties in Coyote Valley, the well is now defunct, and so are the remaining structures on the site. Because the owners uh, made this acquisition for future development, the well and structures have been allowed to deteriorate, and therefore it is only really able to sustain dry farming, in this case, a year-to-year -year lease for hay production. However, on this upcoming Friday, this parcel will close in escrow with funding from the county, the Open Space Authority, the VTA, and the state's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund through the Strategic Growth Council. As a part of this acquisition, the state provided additional funding for an agricultural management plan through which a team of regional farm business experts were able to research the site and its potential for hosting new or expanding farm businesses. Through this process, a wide variety of farmers have already expressed interest in the site from heirloom grains for local baking flour production to specialty vegetable crops and cut flowers to perennial fruit production to commercial seed research and development. Once acquired, the Open Space Authority will formally lease, uh, sorry, release a request for such proposals and select a farmer for a long-term lease or a lease to own contract on the land. Next, I'll take you to 92 acres of walnuts, which were just planted in 2017. This is relevant because although walnuts can be a profitable crop, they take five to seven years until first commercial harvest and really make their full return on investment over the 35 year average lifespan of the orchard. This is a property owner who is also the farmer and also farms on a large scale in the Central Valley. This very recent long-term investment in the heart of Coyote Valley is a testament to at least one serious grower and landowner who believes in the continued viability of farming here. And lastly, I wanna share with you the story of this 20 acre diversified Asian vegetable farm. Uh, Jackie is the farm manager here and he is continuing the operation from his parents who began farming at this location in 1997. Over the past 24 years, they have farmed on a year to year lease, making their own improvements as necessary without any guarantee of long-term tenure. Jackie's portion of the parcel is actually only half the 10 acres to the east with additional farming uh, families operating on the western portions of the lot. 
Jackie grows over 25 crops, which they sell directly to markets in San Jose and the surrounding area. In many cases, these crops are harvested in the morning and are on the shelves of a Ranch 99 or Lion Market by midday. Uh, through these nearby markets and without a middleman and a, with a high demand for their fresh specialty crops, Jackie's operation takes in over half a million dollars per year, over $600,000 on a good year, using only 10 of the acres on this parcel. Through the great work of our County Agricultural Commissioner and our UC Cooperative Extension uh, Small Farm Advisor Program, county staff has learned a great deal about the farming community that Jackie is a part of. We have over 80 Asian family farm operations in the county, growing an awe-inspiring diversity of crops in quick succession and year round. While many of these crops may be special, they are not going to fancy boutique groceries. They're feeding a large portion of the Asian American community. When I last spoke with Jackie, he said he hoped to one day purchase this property, but he knew he would need some financial help to account for the speculative value of the land, likely in the form of a conservation easement. As the county has taken measures to ease the difficulties of farming, the Asian American farmers have by far been the most proactive participants. Since the county streamlined agricultural employee housing, these families were the first in line to take advantage of the new ordinance and have made up the majority of interest, eager to develop new homes for themselves and their workforce. As the county has offered grants for climate smart ag practices, these farm operations made up the majority of those applications as well. Now I wanna just pause and briefly acknowledge that the history of Asian immigrant farmers in Coyote Valley is as long as the history of farming itself on this landscape. From orchards to strawberries and asparagus, to seed production, to chrysanthemum flowers, uh, to direct market diversified vegetables. This diverse and ever-changing community has been the embodiment of resilience on the landscape since the late 19th century. And they have continually innovated and evolved their businesses as the market has shifted dramatically and frequently over time. The history of exclusion and omission is just as long. The Valley of Heart's Delight was for, uh, notorious for promoting itself around the world as being a haven of white only family farms with no Chinese or Japanese laborers supporting them. When in fact, these immigrant communities made up the majority of the workforce at that time and that made our Valley famous for its world-class agriculture. The only way to plausibly assert that farming is not feasible in this area today, as much as any point in the last 140 years, is to exclude or willfully ignore the innovations and the abiding dedication and successes of the Asian American farmers that have for so long been the stewards of this agricultural landscape. We know some of these families who have chosen to move south, expanding their operation to far larger acreage where speculation doesn't inflate the land value as much and the overall stability of land use is greater. Others choose to remain in closer proximity to their markets and their larger community. Some don't have much of a choice, but to hold on and hope for the best. I highlight Jackie's farm here as just one example of this incredibly diverse farming community. 24 years of 12 month leases and nonetheless persisting, expanding a business that his entire uh, extended family depends upon and investing in the infrastructure personally that the landlords have neglected. Landlords who the farmers had not even met in 24 years until we visited the site together last year with a representative of the investment company. Lastly, to reorient ourselves, this farm operation is directly adjacent to that 92 acres of walnuts and that 60 acre hay field to the north. And just to the north of these properties are the three 40 acre parcels that are the subject of a report contracted by the property owners declaring once again that ag is dead here. To conclude, I'll leave you with a photo uh, of those same properties taken four days ago by a farmer who sat in traffic for 20 minutes just to get around them where consumers flocked to patronize this farm stand overflowing the paid parking lot and lining Bailey Avenue on both sides of Santa Teresa. Farming here and making a living, living at it is really hard, there's no question, but it's not a myth or a bygone notion. 
there are a lot of people doing it. And with a lot of different business models, people continue to be eager to come and farm here. And San Jose residents are increasingly eager to visit and patronize these farms. And this concludes my presentation. I'll be available later on for any questions. Thank you. Are there any other presentations? Oh yeah, we're not, Robert has to go back to the staff recommendation. We're doing that. All right. That's kind yeah, of- Yeah, sorry. That's more of a study session. So now we're going on to the. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Michael Meehan, um, for that great presentation. Uh, I'll move on to economic development and opportunities. Um, as mentioned, Coyote Valley, North Coyote Valley in particular has been planned for campus industrial uses for over three decades uh, with the city OSA and post purchase of 937 acres of land for preservation, only approximately 314 acres located south of Bailey Road remain available for industrial development. One of the components of the four-year review scope of work was to analyze the redistribution of planned jobs from North Coyote Valley and potential economic impacts of this. To assist with this work, staff brought on board an economic consultant, Strategic Economics, to conduct an analysis of the potential redistribution of planned job growth and help identify strategies to accommodate future economic growth in San Jose. The full report was included in the Planning Commission packet. Uh, historically, the general plan's vision for North Coyote Valley was for campus industrial uses where technology companies could build campuses where all of their functions, uh, including administration, R&D, and manufacturing could be cons consolidated on one site. Uh, besides the IBM Silicon Valley lab, large-scale industrial development has not occurred in Coyote Valley. The city's consultant analyzed industri industry trends and projected job growth by ABAG, as well as the last 10 years of employment growth in industrial park designated lands in North and South San Jose, and conducted interviews with experienced industrial developers. Based on the analysis, staff found that there's little to no demand for traditional campus industrial office uses in North Coyote Valley. And it's anticipated that if employment users located in North Coyote Valley today it would likely be industrial-based um, industries that typically occupy horizontal buildings, such as manufacturing, transportation, and warehouse uses. Um, based on the interviews with industrial developers, the market demand in Coyote Valley is primarily for large-scale logistic buildings for warehousing and distribution, since these types of users are increasingly focused on last-mile delivery logistics. However, there's actually a higher preference for locating these uses closer to Interstate, Interstate 880 and Highway 237 in North San Jose. Based on the characteristics of warehouse and distribution uses, staff anticipates that approximately 5,500 jobs could be supported on the remaining developable lands in North Coyote Valley. Overall, the economic impact to removing North Coyote Valley as an employment growth area is limited because the planned job growth in North Coyote can be realized elsewhere in the city. However, at the same time, staff wants to stress the importance of protecting industrial employment lands in our urbanized areas uh, to ensure the city is economically balanced, particularly in providing middle wage jobs for San Jose workers. And we have a brief uh, slide for CEQA environmental review from, from David. Good evening. I'm Chair and members of the Planning Commission, David Keon, Principal Planner for the City's Environmental Review Team. I just wanted to mention that the City prepared an initial study um, to analyze the environmental impacts under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, for the totality of the four-year review. So as you saw earlier, the four-year review includes a huge number of actions, an umbrella of many different actions of which Coyote Valley is one part. The initial study evaluated the totality of all of these actions and per the analysis determined that there would be no new significant impacts nor an increase in severity of identified impacts in the general plan EIR or the supplemental EIR prepared in 2015. Therefore, there was a determination that the, an addendum to these EIRs was appropriate level of CEQA review for this project. Now, I did want to just really quickly respond to some comments that were made, uh, public comments that were submitted to the commission 
within the past week regarding the environmental analysis. Um, a couple of these, you know, raised in several letters. Um, one was was stating that the environmental and the initial study addendum does not evaluate the environmental impacts of farming. Uh, wanted to mention that this um, the farming, as we've seen earlier, is a baseline condition there. The proposed land use change is essentially reverting back to the baseline conditions and therefore is not a significant change in CEQA and does not require, and CEQA does not require an analysis of the environmental impacts of maintaining the existing conditions. So this is, you know, so because this project is essentially keeping existing conditions, we are not required to evaluate issues like water impacts to water quality, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. In addition, there is a claim that not allowing industrial development in North Coyote Valley will result in increased traffic, vehicle miles traveled, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I did want to mention that since 2018, the city of San Jose has adopted a policy regarding transportation analysis that uses vehicle miles traveled rather than traffic congestion and level of service as its metric for evaluating impacts for transportation under CEQA. Under vehicle miles traveled, also the totality of the general plan for review actions, including this, the Coyote Valley actions, would reduce total citywide vehicle miles traveled compared to current existing conditions. In addition, it would also reduce citywide greenhouse gas emissions, resulting in a, in a benefit over what was originally evaluated in the general plan. I also want to point out that this Coyote Valley is in an immitigable area per the transportation analysis policy or BMT. Because what this means is that any sort of major development within Coyote Valley would not be able to mitigate underneath thresholds for the amount of vehicle miles travel that it would produce because of its location further away from the rest of urbanized areas in San Jose, meaning that any businesses that locate there will have to have significant amount of travel, auto travel, in order to reach that destination, which would be significantly more than the average citywide vehicle miles travel. Um, this means that any future development that would possibly occur within Coyote Valley would have to do prepare what's known as an environmental impact report, EPIR. Uh, another claim was that the transfer of general plan job capacity in North Coyote Valley to the downtown was not evaluated I did want to bring up that th there has been several transfers of development capacity over the past several years for various projects that have been evaluated. This includes the Downtown Strategy 2040 EIR in 2018 and the Downtown West and Dearden Station Area Plan um, addendum that was prepared and finalized to City Council in May 2021. All of these reports have shown that through the through the through this shifting of development capacities, job capacity into downtown, there's actually a reduction in overall citywide vehicle miles traveled and an improvement in, in per capita greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, the concentration of development downtown hasn't been evaluated with, in, in terms of roadway noise, air quality, and other issues such as historic impacts on historic resources have all been evaluated in those documents. Um, Finally, another comment that was brought up was raised that there was a lack of a public circulation for the initial study addendum. I want to point out that per state law, addendums to existing adopted documents such as environmental impact reports are not required to be circulated for public review. However, I would like to point out that the document has been po posted on the city's website on October 15th, 2021, and everybody who was interested in the project that was on the mailing list was notified when it was posted and it was available for review. That concludes my presentation. I'll revert back to Robert. Thank you. Thank you, David. Lastly, I'll provide a brief overview of task force discussion and recommendations. On October 29, 2020, the task force held a meeting to consider and make recommendations related to Coyote Valley and redistribution of plant growth. Approximately 81 members from the public attended the meeting and 19 members from the public uh, provided comments. Public comments were made in support and in opposition to staff recommendation. Public comments made in support praised the preservation and protection of Coyote Valley, while public comments made in opposition focused on depriving property rights and loss of economic value. 
Staff's new long-term vision reflects many current general plan goals and recognizes Coyote Valley as a unique asset to San Jose that should be preserved as a resource for the community and which furthers the city's goals of environmental sustainability, enhancement of open space, and support of agriculture in the non-urban areas of the city, as well as protecting critical linkages for wildlife movement. So getting the staff and task force recommendation for Coyote Valley, considering the natural and agricultural resources in Coyote Valley and the significant policy shifts that have changed the planning context, the most significant being Measure T and the purchase of and preservation of 937 acres in North Coyote Valley, as well as the current market conditions for industrial uses on the remaining developable lands, staff is proposing six recommendations related to general plan amendments and rezonings. One, remove North Coyote Valley as an employment land growth area from the general plan. Two, change land use designations of properties in North Coyote that have been purchased by the city and post post an OSA for preservation from industrial park to open space parkland and habitat. Three, change the land use designations of remaining properties in North Coyote Valley that have not already been developed for industrial uses from industrial park to agriculture, except for areas occupied by Gavilan College, which would be changed from industrial park to public quasi public, and then rezone properties as needed to align their zoning with their general plan and land use designation. Four, amend the general plan to remove Mid Coyote Valley Urban Reserve designation and redesignate properties in Mid Coyote to either agriculture, private recreation, public quasi public, or combined industrial commercial, and rezone properties within the city's jurisdictional boundaries as needed to align with appropriate general plan land use designations. Five, create and apply a new general plan Coyote Valley agriculture overlay that increases the minimum lot size from 20 acres to 40 acres on certain properties with an existing or proposed agriculture land use designation that are A, within North, Mid, and South Coyote Valley and are inside the city's jurisdictional boundary, and B, within Mid and South Coyote Valley that are outside of the city's jurisdictional boundaries and are zoned exclusive agriculture under the county zoning ordinance, which sets a minimum lot size of 40 acres. Six, within the portion of Mid Coyote that is east of Monterey Highway and currently designated urban reserve continue to allow, allow private recreation uses that are rural in character and are compatible with the Coyote Creek Park chain. Staff added this recommendation um, number six after various conversations with property owners and interest in maintaining similar allowed uses under the urban reserve designation. Um, here's a, a map. These figures were included in the staff report, but here's a map of the existing general plan land use designations and staff's proposed general plan land use designations. I can refer back to these. Um, the existing zoning districts within Coyote Valley and the proposed zoning districts. And then the proposed agriculture uh, overlay. Staff and task force are recommending to add the following action items to the general plan. One, move the urban ser service area boundary north as soon as possible, um, consistent with the proposed land use changes in North Coyote Valley. Properties proposed to retain an urban land use des designation, um, industrial park and public quasi public should stay within the urban service area. Two, explore creating an overlay that would restrict, restrict office buildings as an allowable use in certain industrial park and or combined industrial commercial designated areas or redesignate some areas from IP um, and or CIC to light industrial to preserve and support existing industrial businesses. Three, explore creating an industrial overlay allowing for new office construction only if the office building includes some manufacturing or logistics space. And then four, explore establishment of a climate resilience credit program to support further conservation actions in Coyote Valley and facilitate development in urbanized areas of San Jose. Uh, this recommendation is <clears throat> applicable to North, Mid and South Coyote Valley. After conversations with property owners and the community meeting staff, staff proposed to add additional action items. Um, these are new and not part of the task force recommendation. Um, 
five, study and make revisions to the general plan and zoning ordinance to allow compatible commercial agriculture supportive uses in Coyote Valley. Six, conduct, conduct a study of the Monterey Road corridor through North, Mid and South Coyote Valley to consider appropriate non-residential uses for properties on the east side of Monterey Road that would be compatible with the Coyote Creek Park chain. Sorry, something happened. And then seven, explore establishing a farmland security zone in Coyote Valley. Here's a quick overview of the public outreach that was done. Um, planning staff hosted a virtual community meeting focused on Coyote Valley um, with property owners and tenants on May 17th, 2021 to discuss the proposed policy changes in Coyote Valley associated with the general plan for your review. Approximately 34 members of the public attended the meeting. Staff also attended several meetings, uh, two virtual, two in person with property owners at their request following the community meeting to further discuss the general plan amendments and their concerns about the policy recommendations. Most Coyote Valley property owners who attended the community meeting in, in May 2021 and met with staff following the community meeting opposed the proposed policy changes. Property owner comments and concerns included agriculture is not economically viable in Coyote Valley. Uh, proposed policy changes will devalue land in Coyote Valley. Coyote Valley lacks agriculture infrastructure to support farming. Distance from agriculture industry suppliers and services make farming difficult and challenges with labor costs and hiring agriculture workers is a major problem. The land in Coyote Valley is not nutrient rich like Gilroy and is no longer suitable for agriculture uses. Climate change has, has impacted farming in Coyote Valley. Regulatory issues that create challenges for spraying crops like peppers. Um, disking is integral to agriculture, but not always permitted by property owners who have purchased land for conservation. Um, water costs have increased and water supply issues costs for power have increased and property owners felt they weren't given um, in, or were not able to give their input prior to the task force process. Uh, land use context should be studied along the Monterey corridor and interest in private recreation and farm worker housing uses along Monterey Road. Lastly, staff recommends that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council take all the following actions Adopt a resolution adopting the addendum to the Envision San Jose 2040 General Plan Final Program Environmental Impact Report and Supplemental EIR to the Envision San Jose General Plan fi Final Program EIR and addenda thereto in conformance with CEQA and adopt a resolution approving the General Plan Land Use Transportation Diagram Amendment for properties within North, Mid and South Coyote Valley and the general plan tax amendment associated with Envision San Jose 2040 general plan four year review. Approve an ordinance of the city of San Jose amending title 20 of the San Jose municipal code to amend table 20-40 to incorporate the Coyote Valley agriculture general plan overlay. Approve an ordinance rezoning specified parcels located within North Mid and South Coyote Valley from zoning districts that include agriculture, R11 single family residents, R15 single family residents, plan development, mobile home park, and heavy industrial to zoning districts that include open space, agriculture, combined industrial, commercial, industrial park, and public quasi-public zoning districts. Approve an ordinance rezoning specified parcels located North, Mid, and South Coyote Valley from a agriculture zoning district to a PD plan development zoning district where all agriculture uses shall conform to those uses identified in the A agricultural Agriculture zoning district set forth in the current Title 20 of the San Jose Municipal Code and certain private recreation and open space uses. And this concludes staff's presentation. All right, thank you for that. So we are now moving on to public comment. Uh, Jen, as of right now, I'm seeing 10 hands up for public comment. Do we have any more out there that are going to speak tonight? If so, it would be great if you jumped in now so we can get a sense of how much public comment there is. Um, I haven't received any uh, requests via email, but I do see that the hands are continuing to raise. As of right now, we have 20. 
That's what I'm that's what I'm looking at. 22, 23, yeah. 24. Okay, we're at 23. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, we have 24, 27. It's keep it keeps climbing. In order to give everyone space and in order really to give the commission time to deliberate. Uh, we have read all the comments that have come in, the letters that have come in, uh, and we, of course, want to hear from you. So what I am going to do, Jen, is I'm going to limit public comment to one minute because ideally I'd like for us to spend time as a body deliberating this, this topic. So with that, let's go ahead and start public comment, and we'll do it for a minute. Okay. We're going to go ahead and start with Susan Butler. Granham, go ahead and unmute your device. Hi. I'm a volunteer leader of Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley working to ensure a livable climate for all children. As a task force member, I voted to approve these Coyote Valley recommendations, and I'm here to ask you to do the same. Preservation of Coyote Valley is essential for San Jose to meet its greenhouse gas reduction targets. Much of the valley is natural and working lands, such as grasslands, forests, riparian areas, and farmland. These natural areas can serve as a carbon sink removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequestering it in soil and vegetation. The report from the city and OSA shows that limiting North Coyote Valley to non-urban uses will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 94,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year in 2040. This is both from reduced VMT because there would be no more commuting to and from Coyote Valley Hi, Susan, your time is up. Next, we have Tom Foster. Good evening. Sound check. We can hear you. Okay, great. Good evening, Tom Foster. I'm, uh, I represent the Foster family members. Our family owns the property that's near Santa Teresa and Bailey Avenues. We've owned it for 50 years. And it was um, purchased with the intent for development. And it's currently in contract with Crow Holdings Industrial. And I think it's important to talk about that development environmental goals can be mutually beneficial and supportive. And one of the main environment goals um, was or is to create a wildlife linkage between Santa Cruz Mountains and Diablo. And the purchase of the Sobrado and Brandenburg pieces with the $50 million of Measure T and the 40 million of posts is an important part of that. But it doesn't, it doesn't actually accomplish the goal. There's still 28 million to 57 million of investment needed. And the ability to develop, that can be a way to pay for some of these things. So you know, to me, this is about trying to create a win-win. It's about looking for an opportunity to create a showcase of green development. That's Sorry, Tom, your time's up. Next, we have Robert Wood. Hi, this is Robert Wood. I'm a um, professor of strategic management at San Jose State University. I'm just speaking for myself. Uh, I'm excited about the overall plan, but it's on, uh, my daughter's an organic farmer, and I can say it is possible to do organic farming in this kind of region. Um, but I'm concerned that the fact that there's a rail line uh, running through this uh, property has been ignored, through this valley has been ignored. Uh, and the Caltrain running north from Morgan Hill goes directly to downtown San Jose, San Francisco, and all the key job centers along the way. It would seem to make sense to have a small portion of the urban reserve retained as an urban reserve uh, in case we're not able to fully achieve um, uh, the, the housing that we need in the existing development boundary. Thank you. Next, we have Ed Berg. Hi, I'm Edward Berg. My clients, the Lester, Benson, and Foster families own over 40% of the land that the city calls the remaining developable parcels in North Coyote Valley. Redesignating these properties to agriculture would be an unconstitutional taking of all economically viable use of their land, as shown by the Sumner Agricultural Report that we submitted. There's no contrary evidence as to these properties. The Santa Clara Valley Agricultural Plan does not apply to properties like my clients that are inside the city's urban service boundary. And Mr. Meehan's presentation said nothing about properties in North Coyote Valley. 
If the city wants to preserve these properties at the behest of others, it needs to pay fair market value for them, not unfairly try to take them for free. In addition, the addendum prepared by the city is inadequate under CEQA. The massive changes being recommended require a circulated environmental document. Okay, Ed, your time is up. We have Mark Landgraf. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Mark Landgraf, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. On behalf of the authority, I want to express strong support for the recommendations for Coyote Valley made in the staff report for this agenda item. The public investment of 46 million in 2019 from San Jose's voter approved Measure T to acquire close to a thousand acres in North Coyote Valley for wildlife connectivity, water quality, natural floodplains upstream of urban San Jose must be protected now for the well being of future generations. Allowing piecemeal development on adjacent lands in North Coyote Valley would not only undermine the important conservation values, but it would also jeopardize, jeopardize that future altogether. The Coyote Valley Landscape Linkage Report published in 2017 outlines a comprehensive vision for protection and restoration of natural resources that fully encompasses North Coyote Valley, not just a portion of it. We urge the commission to support the staff recommendations tonight. Thank you. Number ending in 140, go ahead and unmute yourself. You don't need development there, the city can't handle what they have uh, within the, the city limits of San Jose. They're going to try to expand all the way out there. It's not going to work. It's a flood zone. The Native American people were very intelligent. They knew not to, to, to live there for at all because it floods. Coyote Valley, needs, they know what they need to do. Take the coyotes that are ravaging the neighborhoods and the suburbs and send them out to Coyote Valley where they belong. Keep the farms. Keep the green belt. This Look at downtown San Jose. You want to spread that all the way to, to Coyote Valley because that's what San Jose does. It, all it does is spread blight and crime and disorganization and bad infrastructure and everything else. You guys don't need to develop Coyote Valley at all. Keep it the way it is. We're going to need farmland because God's not making any more. And we're going to Next speaker is Alice Kaufman. Uh, good evening, uh, Planning Commissioners. Uh, Alice Kaufman, Legislative Advocacy Director with Green Foothills. We urge you to vote for the staff recommendations. Today, we know many things about Coyote Valley that we didn't know when the general plan was approved. We know that sprawling into our open space will make climate change impacts worse. We know that if we do not preserve as much open space and farmland as possible in Coyote Valley, we'll cut off the wildlife corridor that keeps mountain lions from inbreeding and helps many animal populations survive. We know that Coyote Valley's floodplain can serve a crucial role in reducing flood impacts in downtown San Jose, like the flooding that happened from Coyote Creek several years ago. We know that with the Central Valley's agricultural economy overdrawing their groundwater and with the climate heating up, we need to preserve all our farmland in Northern California where we still have access to groundwater. And as a result of the pandemic, we know that being able to get outside and enjoy nature is not just a nice perk, it's a public health issue and an equity issue. Please vote to support the staff recommendations. Thank you. Mita? Okay, we'll move on to Peter Benson. Sorry. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners, um, citizens. City staff, I live in District 2 and served on the general plan for your review task force as a representative of this district. Um, I'm here tonight to ask you to accept staff recommendations with regard to Coyote Valley. D2 residents were strongly opposed to warehouse development in the valley, concerned about the impact of all those delivery trucks going through our neighborhoods, as well as the impacts to Coyote Valley's own open space and natural resources. But the owners of the remaining privately held property in North Coyote Valley have submitted a letter to the Planning Commission stating that they're under contract to a warehouse developer who has submitted preliminary plans for a warehouse to the city. So the threat is still very real. Also, as Michael Meehan explained so well in his presentation, the argument that agriculture is not viable does not stand up to scrutiny. So we must 
Thank you. Next, we have Peter Benson. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on to Roland. Go ahead and unmute your device. Hi, this is Roland, I live in District 2. So, uh, first of all, I agree with the point that the gentleman made earlier that the fact that this is immediately adjacent to Union Pacific track has been completely ignored. Uh, back in 2013, I reached out to John Risto when he was still working for the VGA to acquire the parcels that were eventually acquired by Panatoni on Blanchard Road to relocate the Caltrain CMOF facility down there, make it electrified, make it sustainable. Similarly, as some uh, uh, people mentioned, if you put distribution warehouses there, you can now bring in electrified rail to move all these materials there for um, local uh, distribution. Uh, jobs, you need jobs down there, otherwise you just have the morning commute north. Um, agriculture, if you want to prove you can be successful in agri agriculture, I would suggest respectfully that you start with the 240 acres at Marshall Cottle Road and see how you can make that work. Thank you. Next, Peter Benson. Hi, my name is Peter Benson. Our family has owned property in North County Valley for over 50 years. Together with adjacent Lester and Foster properties, we are in contract with CHI for an industrial development consistent with our current land use designation. I'm requesting that the Planning Commission not downgrade our property designation from, from industrial to agriculture. During my time living on the property, I witnessed firsthand the heights of successful farming operations and the eventual decline to essentially fallow land. This decline was related in large part to the local packing plants in San Jose and Santa Clara shuttering operations and relocating facilities to the Central Valley. Currently, agricultural pursuits are not viable or sustainable on these lands, and a well thought out and sensible industrial development could provide needed jobs and ensure continued environmental stewardship of the valley. Secondly, our property is not in the 100 year FEMA floodplain and we have never encountered floodwaters in this property. Thank you. Next, we have Greenbelt Alliance. If you can state your name for the record. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Justin Wang, advocacy manager for Greenbelt Alliance. Greenbelt Alliance has been working for over 60 years to encourage both the protection of open space as well as directing development and growth into our existing communities to promote climate resilience. Tonight, we urge you to support the staff recommendations. First of all, thank you to staff for your tremendous work throughout this process. As an effort years in the making, protecting Coyote Valley will be nothing less than a historic moment for San Jose and our communities that will benefit from the protection of Coyote Valley. As we've seen smoke, heat waves, floods, and other climate hazards intensifying in the last few years, it has never been clear these hazards must be planned around. And again, the ecological, agricultural, and climate resilience value of Coyote Valley, particularly as a floodplain and water resource, cannot be overstated. Planning commissioners, by supporting the staff recommendations, general plan amendments, as well as action items to protect North and Mid Coyote Valley, you're contributing to a safer, more climate smart Bay Area for generations to come. Thank you for your time. Hi folks, uh, uh, my name is Sean Hu. I re represent the owner of uh, Coyote Creek Golf Club. Uh, it's an integral part of uh, Monterey Corridor sitting on a 409 acre beautiful open space. Uh, we have uh, 100 people employed there and we provide an important service to the San Jose community. Uh, we applaud the decision to conduct a special study for the corridor, uh, but in order for it to really work, we need the land use decisions to uh, really involve the landowners because uh, we're the ones who have to face unpredict unpredictable economical realities. Um, and uh, the whole time supporting local employment. So we wanna say that uh, we've been continuously investing in the property to keep it afloat, uh, to reduce the risk of going, going down, uh, going bankrupt, uh, we need to um, support uh, economically viable development options such as the ones done in Cordoval. Sorry, Sean, your time's up. Next is Mike King.
Mike, go ahead and, oh, there you go. Hi, this is Michael King. I'm a fourth generation from Santa Clara Valley and we purchased, uh, well, it's a 10 acre parcel, two and a half acres being heavy industrial land that was recommended to us by Jim Lands uh, from Santa Clara County in order to operate our low bed business. Uh, we also transport agricultural equipment to Coyote Valley. So if you change us from heavy industrial to agricultural, we will no longer be able to exist there, which will be a devaluing of the property that we bought of heavy industrial. And also it's necessary for the farmers of Coyote Valley. In fact, the last weekend we held uh, grain drills and swathers into Coyote Valley. So your one size fits all plan um, of the changing the zoning of our two and a half acres is not feasible. Thank you. Next, Michael Karp. Michael Karp. Okay, we'll move on to Will Sato. I'm there. Oh, my, oh, okay, go ahead, Michael. Hey, good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Michael Karp. I'm a managing director at Cushman and Wakefield. I represent the Lesters and the Foster Benson families as part of their real estate brokerage team. The dynamics of the industrial real estate market are incredibly strong, which uh, may seem counterintuitive during the COVID era that we're currently living in. But the reasons for these are many. Key factors are consumers are pivoting from traditional retail to internet sales. There's a reemergence of manufacturing processes being brought back to the US shores due to the crippling supply chain constraints. A surge in life science, pharma and device development is occurring and critical semiconductor production all contribute to the local demand. Despite millions of new square feet of development in the Bay Area over the last eight years, vacancy re re uh, rates remain extremely low in every market. The Lester Foster Benson site offers a unique opportunity to develop state-of-the-art facilities at scale of unavailable anywhere in San Jose for that matter. Any Sorry, Michael, your, your time is up. Will Sasso? Ken Sasso speaking. Uh, we need to have the commission not vote on the PD zoning on the east side Monterey corridor as it is written till there is a study that will involve the landowner's input rather than anybody else's input. Uh, we are the people that have owned that property for almost a hundred years. I represent six generations and uh, since 1927, our land has been uh, along the corridor. I've been there all my life. I'm 78 years old. I've been on many, many studies of the Coyote Valley, both city and county. I tried to get on the committee that was formed to discuss the Coyote Valley and was turned down. And I think that was um, the whole situation has been done without landowner farmers input whatsoever. Leo Cassidy. Leo Cassidy, go ahead and unmute your device. Okay, we'll move on to Sam Farb. Thank you. My name is Sam Farb. My client, Linda Lester, Lester, along with her client, own approximately 42 acres in North Coyote Valley, bordering on the north by Bailey Avenue. Unfortunately, the task force has produced no credible evidence that agricultural use of the Lester's property, along with the Foster and Benson properties, is economically viable. During public meetings, all landowners who have farming operations on their properties and who spoke at meetings told the task force and city planning staff that farming is not financially viable. There wasn't a single owner who said it was financially viable. The city planning staff, however, ignored all public comments and never conducted its own study. After it became apparent that the staff would not study the issue, 
my client, along with others, commissioned a study by Dr. Daniel Summer, a professor at UC Davis. A copy of that report has been provided to the Planning Commission and concludes that agriculture is not financially viable on these properties. Okay, we're gonna try um, Leo Cassidy again. Leo, go ahead and unmute your device. My name is Leo Cassetti. I'm a family member of the Marquise Orchard on Monterey Corridor. We've been uh, farming that uh, cherry orchard since 1975. And uh, I want to take exception to Michael Meacham's uh, viability of uh, the cherry orchard being a sustainable long-term product. We cannot control the market regardless if we have a, a good crop or not. We have put 460,000 plus dollars in micro sprinkler systems and weather stations and soil probes another 10,000. So we have invested into the property and it is not viable as of this year. And I can show him our year end statement. Thank you. Carol Watts. Uh, thank you. I'm Carol Watts, president of the League of Women Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara. And our organization has watched and studied Coyote Valley for many years. We strongly support the recommendations from staff and urge you to vote to approve them. We believe the changes will make San Jose better positioned to adapt to climate change and to make our valley more sustainable, to protect open space, local agriculture, and wildlife habitation. Uh, we urge your strong support for the new designations for Coyote Valley. Thank you very much. Chris Marchese. Chris Marchese, please unmute your device. Okay, we're gonna move on. Okay, here we go. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Yes, yes. yes. Good evening, Honorable. Commissioner Bonilla and other commissioners. I thank you on behalf of the Marchese family, which owns 220 acres of a cherry orchard since 1975. I can personally attest as being personally involved all of those years that while I would love for agriculture to be viable, it no longer is. And mostly it was because San Jose chased out all the infrastructure that agricultural needed, and it is never coming back in a commercially viable way. Those little micro farms are wonderful and great, but when you have 221 acres, it's hard to farm in today's world when you have no employees. Furthermore, I always keep my promises. San Jose promised and annexed and and zone properties along the corridor, and now they're changing it. They didn't keep their promise. Peter Rothschild. Hi, my name is Peter Rothschild. I've been a commercial real estate broker for over 50 years. I've been involved with the Foster Benson property for approximately 20 years and a part of the brokerage team representing the Lester Foster Benson 126 acre assemblage. This assemblage is well suited for industrial development. It is not in the floodplain. It is not affected by animal corridors as utilities to the property line has frontage on Bailey Avenue and Santa Teresa Boulevard fronts on mainline rail has direct access to the Bailey 101 interchange. Since the properties were designated IP in the 2040 general plan, there has been a large amount of developer interest. The properties are now in escrow for industrial development. 
As far back as I can remember, the Planning Commission and the City Council considered these properties development land. I urge you to keep the present designated zoning IP on this prime 126 acre assemblage. Thank you for your consideration. Janet Hebert. Hello. Hi, Janet, we can hear you. Um, my name is Janet A. Bear. My family, this property that we have in the Coyote Valley has been in our family for over 100 years. My parents farmed it with prunes when that was no longer viable. Uh, my father leased the land for row crop. After a few years, that was no longer viable. And then my father sold much of his property to Asian farmers who started uh, flowers and then vegetables. And now many of those houses have the plastic uh, blowing in the wind. They were not able to make a living from it either. Uh, Mr. Meehan cherry picked some of the examples. A hay farmer we had heard is not able to work and farm his land during three and uh, six o'clock because of the traffic. The walnut orchard is owned by an investor who has a brother who has the infrastructure of a uh, in the other valley. I was talking to a woman who has 36 acres for sale. Not a single farmer wanted to buy it. Po Sorry, Janet, your time is up. Brian Schmidt. Uh, good evening, Brian Schmidt here for uh, Greenfoot Hills and Legislative Advocacy Director. And I strongly encourage you to support the staff recommendations. Protecting Coyote Valley has been delayed for decades, uh, delaying the chance to restore the habitat and enhance the farmlands. So I urge you to avoid any further delay. And I'd like to add that contrary to the assertions from some lawyers representing uh, some landowners, Mr. Meehan's presentation was cl clearly relevant to North Coyote Valley with economic viability demonstrated on properties, on, on uh, presentations that you saw, I guess about a mile, maybe less than that from North Coyote Valley. There is no magic line that suddenly makes that economic viability suddenly become unviable with movement across across the, that that invisible line in North Coyote Valley. And that his last present last uh, visual was of Spina farm stand in North Coyote Valley itself. They have to adapt to the current businesses, transfer farms, but it can be done. Thank you. Shawnee Cleanhouse. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Johnny Kleinhaus. I'm the Environmental Advocate with Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, speaking in support of staff recommendation. Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society is focused on protection of birds and wildlife and their habitat and the enjoyment of nature and education of young and old. 200 bird species have been observed in Coyote Valley, delighting birders and nature lovers. We have been advocating for the preservation of open space, wildlife habitat, and movement corridors for wildlife and for migratory birds for over 30 years. San Jose has the responsibility to secure a future that safeguards our common natural resources, including our wildlife and our groundwater. So I join others in asking you to preserve the valley and approve staff recommendation. Thank you. Chuck Reed. Good evening, I'm Chuck Reed. Hopkins and Carly represents the Fred and Grace Luster families property in North Coyote Valley has been designated by the general plan for decades to be developed for employment uses. Changing the land use designation to agriculture is an unconstitutional taking of the property rights unless the owners are properly compensated. My client's property is not in a flood zone or a wildlife corridor as shown in the Open Space Authority linkage report. The property could be developed without significant impacts on the environment while using infrastructure that's already in place. Development of the property could also make a major contribution to the wildlife corridor infrastructure needs that have been identified in the linkage report in Appendix 3. I urge you to maintain the existing general plan designation on my client's properties. Thank you. Jerry DeYoung. It's you, Jerry DeYoung. Good evening. 
I'm a planning consultant to several of the major landowners in the Monet Corridor and Coyote Valley. I'd like to address the shortcomings of the planning process to date with regard to the involvement or lack thereof of the affected property owners. It was almost a year ago that the task force followed the staff's recommendations. One week ago, the staff report was released to you and the public. Thus, the owners have had one week to review the modified and expanded recommendation in the staff report. The commission has had a long history of continuing public hearings when the applicant and or staff hasn't adequately interacted with individuals or community group. Tonight, the city is the applicant. The commission has always had a strong desire for transparency, involvement, and equity in land use process that brings items before you for deliber deliberation. My request on behalf of the property owners is that you continue this hearing and your recommendations to a future date when the staff will have created an opportunity to meet with the affected property owners to discuss additional concerns and recommendations. Thank you. Juan E. My name is Juan Estrada. While I recently joined the staff at Green Foothills, I'm speaking tonight as a general plan review task force member. The health of our communities is dependent on protecting the environment and preserving open space. Past development relied on sprawl into open space, resulting in inequitable impacts. Marginalized communities in urban areas never received investment. Now, I'm a strong supporter of housing. For example, I made the task force motion to explore opportunity housing citywide instead of inequitably limiting it to certain areas. But Coyote Valley would be the wrong place for housing. This is San Jose's last remaining landscape linkage where wildlife can travel from the Santa Cruz Mountains to the Diablo Range. It needs to be protected. We need to invest in our San Jose communities by building more infill housing that people can afford, planting more trees and creating urban parks and green space close to where people live. Please vote tonight to support the staff recommendations. Thank you. Good evening, Norm Mattione speaking on behalf of several property owners along the east side of the Monterey Corridor. I, I see that there's a recommendation to propose PD zoning for private recreation along the east side of the Monterey Corridor. I question whether you can go forward with that action because it has not been properly noticed as an <coughs> ordinance to be adopted. Well, it recognizes the distinction of the corridor that we've long been advocating from the rest of the Coyote Valley. It does not have the proper standards for applying any of the uses. It requires compatibility with the, core, uh, with the park chain. That is not defined. It requires 50% of the property be maintained as open space. That is not defined. This needs the full study before you go forward with any adoption of a PD ordinance for private recreation and the recognition of the distinctness of the corridor. Thanks. Philip Process. Good evening, Commissioner. So I'm with Crow Holdings and we are in escrow as previously stated to purchase 126 acres from the Lester Benson, Denning, and Foster families, the corner of Bailey and Monterey Roads. I think the previous speakers have made a compelling case for why by right development should be allowed to occur on their lands. I'm here tonight to tell you that we have a tenant who wants us to build them a facility on this site that would generate thousands of jobs and millions of dollars in revenues for the city of San Jose. I'll say that again. We have a user that wants to create thousands of jobs in the city and millions of dollars in revenue. This is not a speculative development with empty promises. This is a real-time project that will bring significant economic activity to the city. What I can also tell you is that this tenant is on a path to powering all of its operations with 100% renewable energy by 2025 and has made a pledge to be net zero carbon by 2040. This is exactly the type of tenant a forward-thinking city like San Jose should welcome. We believe this project to be a win-win-win. Hi, Philip. Sorry, your time is up. Roger Costa. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am part of a family that has owned property in the Coyote Valley for over a century. We are a farming family. I attest that farming is no longer 
economically viable despite the glib presentation you heard. San Jose population growth over the period of 2010 to 2020 grew at 6%. Morgan Hill has grown at three times that rate. Gilroy has grown at twice that rate. Hollister has grown at three times that rate. Los Banos has grown at twice that rate. Most of that population growth travels northward. Please evaluate VMT considerations with a broader circle than just San Jose. Please be wise. This is a um, preserving Coyote Valley as an ag area is, is a myth. Do not fall for it. Next, we have number ending in 931. Can you please state your name for the record and unmute your device? Phone number ending in 931. Please click star nine to unmute your device. We got him to unmute. Hi. Hi, this is Jerry Strangis. I also represent uh, Crow Holdings on the Foster Benson uh, Lester property. I think you have an opportunity tonight to really look at a win-win situation. Uh, you got a couple thousand jobs, you got millions of dollars of revenue, and you have an opportunity to actually contribute to the animal migration corridor. Uh, there's nothing in the linkage report from the Open Space Authority as to where that money is coming from. Uh, there is an opportunity to actually get money through this development to fund that migration corridor so the animals can actually traverse from the east side of Highway 101 to the west side of 101. You have the you have Monterey Road, you got the uh, railroad, you got uh, Santa Teresa. Uh, there's some crossings that have to be bridged there. So there's an opportunity to look at a real win-win situation. I hope you'd allow an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Okay. So just seeing no more public comment, that, that now concludes our public comment. We are now moving to the portion of Commissioner questions and deliberation. Uh, I do see that Commissioner Oliveira has his hands up. Michael, your hand has been up. I don't know if that was an accident or you have something you want to say. All right, looks like it was an accident. So Commissioner Olvero and then Commissioner Torrance. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanted to understand, I was under the understanding we were gonna have a study session on this item. It's probably the most complex item that's come to Planning Commission in a long time. And I'm curious why that study session was canceled. Um, I'll answer that. This We basically gave the study session. So we, we did the study session. We just did it in the evening. It was felt that instead of doing it in the in the in the afternoon and then going through public comment and then coming back and doing it sort of a, a small a shorter version of it and going through it again wasn't needed and we just would do it as, as sort of one item so that was the study session presentation that we gave okay well thank you for that answer um on the when the county planner was discussing the obstacles to agriculture uh he listed several but i did not hear water um, was that my failure to hear, or did he? Was that not a, a, a point he brought up? Michael's on the line still, so I think I would I would let him. He should answer that question. Sure, happy to. Um, the The question of water is a good one because, in fact, the water security, as far as agriculture goes, particularly in California, is is quite good in Coyote Valley. We have a very high groundwater table, and during the five-year drought that you may recall from uh, a couple years ago, it was one of the only aquifers in the state where agricultural producers did not have a limitation on the amount of water that they could pull. The aquifer is very healthy. Obviously, uh, with the Anderson Dam situation currently, the overall water situation in our region is not what it should be. Um, but in terms of agricultural viability or in terms of the uh, farmer's access to water, the primary obstacle is the maintenance and 
um, drilling of wells. Many of the wells have failed. If a parcel doesn't have access to water in Coyote Valley, the reason is the well. It's not the lack of access to water. Uh, I, so you're saying it's the well technology. It's not that the water doesn't exist un underneath. It's not, I wouldn't even necessarily, it's a matter of technology. It's a matter of disrepair. If a house starts falling down out of disrepair, it's not that the technology was wrong. It's just that it wasn't uh, maintained. So if I'm hearing from you, then you're saying an agricultural user would have access to essentially unlimited water from well? The, I mean, water rights in California are certainly something I don't think we want to get into uh, in this Well, meeting. I mean, I think it's really the, important for this, so I hope you do yeah. cover that. Well, so uh, I'd say that the short answer is yes. The long answer would be that um, the costs and uh, the costs of pumping water are not what they are in other regions. And so from my experience talking with farmers, the primary obstacle is the fact that Valley Water charges an industrial uh, manufacturing rate for agricultural users and um, has long uh, subsidized that through an open space credit due to the inherent benefits of the aquifer being recharged on those lands. However, there's constant push to remove that open space credit and charge the full industrial manufacturing rate for uh, the farmers in, in irrigating uh, their lands. And so I would say that while there's certainly not an objective limitation on the ability for a farmer to pull water out of the aquifer, as long as their well is functioning. The realistic limitation is the cost imposed uh, by Valley Water. So if I'm a farmer on this land and in the future Valley Water decides to raise the rates to industrial, which I can't control, that would make agricultural unviable. Sure, I, that's, I mean, that's, that's certainly, it's, there's, I mean, that's a, there's a, a, there's a risk. There is a, a degree to which that would be the case. I would say that the larger producers uh, that are heavy water users are far more at risk. And um, Valley Water, I think, has received a lot of pushback, including from the County Board of Supervisors, including from the agricultural community. And I think they've really reevaluated their approach. Um, I'll also say that I think that their designation of that area charging industrial manufacturing rates is not a coincidence and it has large part to do with the land use history and the zoning of that area for industrial and manufacturing. And so I would hope that with a strong signal from the city and the county that the Valley Water District would uh, no longer pursue charging farmers an in industrial manufacturing rate because that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think in such a complex uh, decision-making process where there's a lot of what ifs, having county uh, valley water uh provide you know in writing what their policy is going to be would be helpful because the county board of supervisors nor the city council can control them they are their own elected body under the state law and they can do as they wish and i think that's a huge huge variable there so i really appreciate your answers and i noticed you were speaking from notes would you be able to provide those notes sure yeah, I would because there's a lot of other comments in there that I don't I didn't write down, but I'm just uh, curious on that. And then, Chair, I have several questions, so I'm just want to make sure that that's okay to continue asking questions of staff. That that is okay to continue asking questions of staff for sure. Thank you kindly. Um, the difference in jobs, if you're eliminating this area from what it's been in the general plan for decades uh, and saying, hey, we'll locate those inland. Aren't you talking about a different job? Because the, the, the job is going to be in the interior of the city in a new construction class A office space, which is really going to be tech worker only, advanced degree only, uh, mostly, uh, versus a warehouse or light manufacturing or even advanced manufacturing tends to be uh, more jobs that have don't have advanced degrees or college degrees, but can pay, uh, you know, good wages, et cetera. Uh, is, would I be correct the fact that we are transferring and, and almost making a decision on what type of jobs or what type of people we want to live in San Jose? Robert, <clears throat> Robert Rivera, I can answer that question. Um, the jobs that were initially uh, allocated to North Coyote Valley were envisioned to be those what we are calling vertical type jobs, um, those office industri 
industrial campus tech jobs that um, can be easily vertical. Uh, the horizontal jobs or the warehouse distribution, large square footages, um, those types of jobs uh, can also be accommodated, but more so in, in North San Jose. So we're not um, changing any of the, the jobs per se. It's shifting uh, the jobs to different areas that, that could be used. Okay. And then under our study session last week, Nancy Klein told uh, the Planning Commission that San Jose has a scarce amount of uh, land for jobs, approximately 12%. If this were to occur, does staff understand what that new rate uh, percentage would be? Would it be, for example, 11? Would it be 10? What would be the difference between the current 12 percent? Yeah, we have that information. You want to look it up, Robert? It's in the staff report. Um, well, one second. Yes. Yeah, I'll give him a second to. Uh, That's why I can ask another question if we want to come back to it. Yeah, I think just one thing to just be aware of with our recommendation while he's looking for that is that, you know, we recognize, so one of the issues that we do have in San Jose is that we do have a fair amount of industrial land or industrial park land, but, you know, we are seeing, we have been seeing some more higher tech users kind of moving into the areas that, um, that you know, typically in the past would have been occupied by more industrial down and dirty type users. And so one of our action items that we recommend, if you notice in our recommendation, is to actually explore um, different approaches to reserve that land for actual industrial development and preclude higher end tech users, users from com coming in. So I just want to sort of um, point to that. The other areas, I think, you know, there are some areas around 237 where we've heard from um, office, I'm uh, sorry, warehouse, um, distribution developers that there is land up there that the city has control of. We have to go through the surplus land process, but that's the kind of land that they're, they're very interested in um, for warehouse distribution type of uses and other industrial uses. And that's the kind of uses that the city would, would support up there. So However, a Michael, uh, surplus land, even as a charter city would be first up would be for low income housing. It wouldn't be job land. Is that correct? Well, it's it's very complicated because that land is planned for industrial. So while an affordable housing developer would have first right of refusal, they would be getting purchasing on uh, industrial land. So it's it's a lot. It's pretty complicated. Vera knows a lot more about sure. than me. So they have to go through a general plan amendment process, is my understanding. And there's well, they, all, they, they also they also pay market rate for the property, and so um, it's not at a reduced rate. I have the answer. So of the remaining 314 acres of developable lands for employment, um, North Coyote could support approximately 5,500 jobs or 1% of the general, general plan's total planned employment capacity. Right, and what's that, so what's that reduce the actual acreage of land in the city? Do we go from 12 to 11? Does it go to 11.5? Does it go to 10? When you, when you take out all these acres of land? That was my question. I can look up the, the acreage, but it would uh, subtract the total by 314. Um, yeah, we, we have that in the staff report. I We have that information, I believe, is in the staff report. Let, let Robert look it up. It, it yeah. is. It's in the same paragraph, actually, that he was just quoting for it from. It's the sentence above it. Uh, yeah, based on current market trends and demand, staff estimates that North Carolina Valley in its entirety could support approximately 18,000 industrial-based jobs. Yeah, I guess, uh, let me just try to ask this question again. Uh, Economic Director Nancy Klein told the Planning Commission at her study session, last, the last session, that, uh, or on last Friday, that, uh, or a retreat, pardon me, that 12% of the land in San Jose is zoned for jobs, meaning 88% is residential, parks, quasi-public, streets. My question is, if this land is removed, and rezoned, or what? Where does that take that twelve percent number? Yeah, we have that. We just have to find the number. I think it's actually in the staff report. So we'll have to look. So we'll have to get. And back. I'm happy to wait, or I can go on to the next question. 
Yeah, we should just go go on. But I, I really would like an answer to that. If it's in the staff report, that's great. Just doing a, you know, find a control F and uh, seeing where that might be would be great. Um, so uh, this is for uh, the uh, David Keon. So um, if uh, Gilroy or Hollister decides to build, uh, a, you know, a permitted uh, multi-thousand person job type of use, how does that affect VMT? Commissioner Oliverio. So they would have yes. to, at per state law, they are required to also follow um, vehicle miles traveled as the veteran for CEQA. So chances are, if they were to propose a large job facility down in one of those areas, they'd have to do an EIR and go through their process and evaluate vehicle miles traveled. Um, mm -hmm. It would be very high vehicle miles traveled, though each jurisdiction has the ability to shape their own policy for how they determine impacts and mitigations under CEQA. But they would have so, to do an evaluate under CEQA. Of course. So every every municipality would do their own uh, CEQA report. But in mm -hmm. the end of the day, these are still, whether it's Gilroy or Coyote, you still have uh, vehicle mile vehicle trips on 101 south and north, or mostly mm -hmm. north, I take it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so. Yes. Yeah. And so the. You know, so because traffic congestion is no longer a metric under um, CEQA for determining impact um, per the state law, we now would basically be evaluating vehicle miles traveled, though I, I'm sure that Gilroy or Morgan Hill also have other measures that are beyond the CEQA in terms of measuring traffic congestion. In San Jose, we wouldn't measure that as part of CEQA, but you measure what's called part of local transportation analysis. Like, for example, if somebody was to come in and build a distribution center in Coyote Valley. They'd have to do their own EIR. That would include mm -hmm. transportation analysis of VMT, but it would also include a vehicle, in addition to vehicle miles traveled analysis, what's called a local transportation analysis. So we're looking at congestion on freeways, congestion on streets, turning radius. You know, that would all be part of that analysis, though it wouldn't be used for determining impact under CEQA. But fair to say if another city approved that use, the impact would affect the environment that impact would affect San Jose, but mm -hmm. San Jose as a community and a municipality would uh, would not have any of the revenue that those city that city would obtain. Yeah, they would. Yeah, it would be down there. They'd have to. They'd have to do their evaluation and have their own impacts. Fair enough. And then I'll just pause to see if staff found the answer. I can go to another question. Yeah, we did. It's on page twenty-two of the staff report at the bottom. It says the removal of, of the entire North Coyote Valley employment lands growth area would result in a 32% citywide reduction of lands designated for industrial park and an 11% reduction of an all employment lands where employment lands represent only 15% of lands in the city. Um, however, considering, uh, so the 314 acres mm -hmm. Um, would result in a 6% reduction citywide of lands de designated for industrial park and a 2% reduction of all employment lands citywide. So then I think we're at like 9.7. Well, it's a 2% reduction. I don't know. Yeah. How does that work? I mean, we're talking about reducing yeah. land available for jobs by, you know, uh, at, at, you know, 22% aggregate. Uh, no, it would result, let's see, a 2% two two reduction of all employment. Yeah, I have to do the math. Two. Well, we can, you can let you do that math. I mean, I think it's an important question, though, for the, you know, San Jose's always had this jobs housing imbalance, and uh, we had such small land for jobs, and we had banked this land for decades to happen, and there is an impact. I'm just curious what that aggregate impact is. So. It's also important to, pardon me. It's also important to note that um, much of the the majority of the lands in North Coyote Valley um, were being shifted to open space parklands and habitat. And through the purchase of Post and OSA in the city, um, the majority of that land is being preserved for open space parklands and habitat. Um, right. That land remaining been written off for job land at this point. Yeah, and that also includes those lands. So the real reduction is is minus the 937 acres that that 
was acquired yeah. by the city. Well, that's in the staff report. So the reduction is a 2% reduction of employment land citywide. The question is, what does that do to the overall percentage of employment lands in the city, which I think is yes. right. And we'd have to do the math. Okay, that's cool. Um, just wanted to ask the question. Hopefully to get an answer at some point would be fantastic. I really appreciate, appreciate your efforts on that. And mm -hmm. then uh, on, uh, so prior to the general plan task force discussion on this item, I understand that there was no outreach to the property owners prior to it being discussed at the general plan task force. Is that correct? Well, so, I mean, you have to, re you have to remember that the task force process itself is really seen as the primary source of outreach as part of that mm -hmm. process. We did meet with property owners. I mean, I, uh, to be fair at their request, I think was prior to, or prior to the task force process, um, property owners did participate, many of them in the task force, they came and spoke and, and spoke their, their, um, their voice. And, and we did meet with some of them at their request. But yeah, so most of the actual, we met with them um, more extensively um, after, as we were developing our recommendation after the recommendation came out. Okay, understood. Um, Commissioner, I, I, Oliver, I, Com Commissioner yes. Oliver, I know there's some questions that um, staff is researching for you. What I'm gonna do, if you're okay with it, is I'm going to call on Commissioner Torrance, Commissioner Young, and then circle back with you so we can kind of also clear the queue a little bit. I understand you have more questions and- uh, Yes. But I want to give them the opportunity as well. Are, are okay. we- Okay. Thank you. I'll do that then. Uh, Commissioner Torrance and Commissioner Young. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, everyone. So I, I'm looking at this um, and especially having just gone through a pandemic, one of the saving graces of that was having our open hills to go and hike in. And it is because of the vision of city leaders, county leaders, state leaders, I believe, and nonprofits that we have those hills remaining open. And as someone who grew up, you know, not with much money, um, having these places that are available to the public is huge. I remember growing up thinking about every little bit of farmland within San Jose that was developed that often it didn't seem like the developers thought much about quality of life for the residents. And so this is a chance um, for quality of life to, to trump. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that word, to, to reign supreme. And, uh, and for this land to, to you know, have this designation of agricultural. Um, so I understand the, the frustration on the part of the, the property owners. I, I do, because you've been banking on, um, you know, this being funds for your families and, and for whatever. Um, but I, I mean, what I've heard so far about the the uh, agricultural lands be that there is some viability and that once this is all designated as such, then those, those um, kids that are in college right now studying agriculture, like someone I know who's studying mushroom farming or foraging, um, could have a chance to go and lease land and, and, and take on those things because we do need vegetables and, and produce in the city of San Jose. And so um, I am definitely leaning toward um, approving or, or voting yes for staff recommendations and um, this general plan. Sorry, I'm losing some of my language. Um, moving forward uh, with the proposal. And, uh, and, and one more thing, when, when, if this is to move forward, um, that can be something that can be addressed as far as the wildlife, having bridges for them to be able to, to travel properly where they need to go, getting over the train tracks, getting over Monterey and Santa Teresa. Those things can be built in. It doesn't have to be reliant on um, developing it in order to create those things for wildlife. That can be done as part of this process. Uh, so that's my two cents. And I would like to make a motion to approve the recommendation. I know we have a lot more people to hear from, but I'd like to put that motion on the floor. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll, 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 we'll put a, as I tell my kids sometimes, we'll, we'll put a pin on it. Thank you for, for doing that. But I definitely want to 
give Commissioners Young, Cantrell, and I know Oliverio has more questions, but we will definitely put that motion out there and we'll ask for a second at, at some point. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Torrance. Uh, Commissioner Young. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Benia. I just have a, a process question I wanna clarify. I do have a couple of questions for staff, but I also have some other comments. Would you like me just to limit it to the questions at this time? You know, let's let's start, go ahead and knock out the questions uh, and then we can make that comment to staff. Let's try to. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for staff on the 314 acres remaining for development for employment uses. Could one of the staff members highlight that on a map or diagram or one of the slides that you presented? Robert can bring that up. Sure, let me bring up the um, PowerPoint real quick. This slide shows the 314 acres of developable lands within the North Coyote Valley. Um, it's the light teal blue. Okay, so what I'm seeing, I just want to make clear, is um, there's three little, uh, there's three light teal blue sections south of Bailey Road. Those are the 314 acres we're discussing, correct? Correct. Okay, great. Um, what is the current land use designation and zoning for, for those? The current land use designation is industrial park. And I believe the zonings vary. Um, they depend on which parcel we're looking at, but there's a variety of uh, PD zoned parcels that were never uh, effectuated um, in the area. And I can move to the zoning uh, map that I have on. So as you can see, the um, IBM's office is is zoned as IP, uh, Industrial Park with a PD zoning, and various other parcels have an agriculture PD zoning um, on their, their property. Um, And on the west side of, of Santa Teresa, the land use does, the zoning district is R1, R15, single family residence, I believe. Okay, um, could, we, could you go back to the land use, uh, the, the, first, um, the first slide you showed? There's a land use designations. Correct. Existing land use designations. Uh, it's the one with the teal, the teal uh, properties. One second. Okay, great. So um, my question is, uh, I just want to be clear that I understand those three teal sections are 314 acres that under current land use designation could be developed for industrial manufacturing use. Is that correct? Uh, potentially, yes, correct. Okay. So um, under this general plan amendment, what would be the proposed land use description and zoning for those three parcels? For these parcels, the proposed land use designation is agriculture. I believe I'll show up the map. Um, it'll be agriculture uh, for the, the developable parcels, um, as well as PQP uh, for the existing Gavlin College um, and uh, Morgan Hill Charter School. Okay, thank you. So just just to make sure I understand, so under the under the staff recommendation and the task force recommendation, those 314 acres would be designated for agricultural use and would no longer be available for uh, industrial manufacturing use. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, great. Um, Chair Benia, the, those are the only questions I have at, at this time, but I'll reserve some time later to make some other comments. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner Young. 
Uh, we have Commissioner Cantrell, and then we have uh, Vice Chair Casey. Commissioner Cantrell, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Can I can I ask you to go back to the the T the one with the TO? Land? Sure. Okay. Uh, now there's a there's a wildlife corridor here, right? Um, where where are we where is the land that is potentially going to become a warehouse on this map? I am unsure which which parcels, but it may be. Um, yeah, answer that. I mean, it's on the um, it's on the property on the southeast quadrant of Bailey and Santa Teresa. The you see that large teal? No, 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 no. No, that um, it's the large teal properties right off Monterey, west of Monterey Highway. Oh, here. Oh, yeah, and those kind of where Spino Farms or next to Spino Farms. That's that's my understanding. Okay, and and I know there's a, a, a corridor there that wildlife travels through. Do we know where that is located, as opposed juxtaposed to this piece of land? I believe there's a wildlife crossing south within the urban reserve, but there's not a wildlife crossing yet um, within the within the portion. reference to making that more possible somehow. Yeah, so I think that the wildlife is using this kind of a lot, the large area to sort of get from the yeah. Santa Cruz mountain range to the Diablo mountain range. But they don't understand the boundaries that we do, right? Well, there's study. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Well, there, there are studies that have been done that kind of shows where the animals are trying to get across the highway yeah. um, and where they kind of move. I, we don't have those on the top of our head, but there, there are studies that showing of, you know, where, where, it's very challenging because there's a median in the middle of Monterey Highway. There's very few, um, you know, culverts to go under. So they kind of get focused in certain areas. Um, so there is a lot of studies on that, um, but I don't know, I can't give you this, we can't give you the specific sort of location about where- We don't know how this use might impact that process of, of wildlife. We don't, process. and that would be something that would be studied if, if a project moves forward, if a consideration would be an envir additional environmental analysis. But if it's farmland, it's not required. Right. Okay. So what happens when you build a, a warehouse and there's all this hardscape? Um, where's the runoff going? Assumably the runoff would go into the aquifer. Um, well, yeah, I mean, David, do you want to answer that one? I mean, I think, you know, you have to do a stormwater management plan, right? So, um, you know, you'd have to figure out ways. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, David. So all development projects would have to comply with the city stormwater. Um, you know, they have to prepare a stormwater management plan. They'd have to comply with state law for low impact design. There'd be, you know, they'd have to treat the water to make sure there's no pollutants going over into creeks and into aquifers. So they'd have to comply with all current current state laws. So if it was agriculture, would would those things be the same? Yeah, it, it'd be more impervious surface. Like, so if you're gonna come in and say, pave it, then yeah, you'd have to treat, but agriculture, because it's there, you know, they yeah, they wouldn't be subject to those laws because it's pervious surface. So it seems like a safer use to the land. Okay, um, I think I have one more question. So I, I'm just curious, and I think um, Commissioner Alberio was asking questions about the impact on uh, potentially on potential jobs uh, for San Jose if this community was removed. That percentage is what? Yeah, so the percentage is of the three and 14 acres would be a reduction of industrial park land of 6% citywide and a 2% reduction of employment land citywide. Okay, okay. But none of that, that's a belief because this land has been sitting how many generations without any development? Correct. Yes, yes. Um, but, I, but I mean, I, I think to be fair, there, we, we've, we, did an, we did a study with um, an economic analysis. We had a consultant do that. They interviewed uh, developers 
And just, you know, I want to be full disclosure here. They said, you know, there would be developers that are interested, that would be interested in building sort of an Amazon warehouse distribution type of center down here. Yeah. Um, and you did hear the speaker mention that, I, I mean, we don't know, this is, they didn't share the information to us, but they're claiming that they have an actual client that'd be interested in occupying a space there. So, I mean, um, yeah. Has there been a study of what the traffic impact and the, the carbon impact is of a warehouse and trucks in this location? That, that would have to be repaired if that was actually brought forward for proposal. They'd have to study that as part of the EIR. Okay. So there has been no study, you know, on a project level of that analysis. The analysis that's been done has been for the general plan EIR. Okay. What, what we heard in our, in our, you know, in our in our in develop interview with developers is the ideal location to be more centrally located. And, you know, one example of that is Owens Corning in Santa Clara that's been there since 1948 is selling their land for an, to Prologis to build an Amazon warehouse. So. <laughs> That's the more ideal location. We have property, as I mentioned, in North San Jose along 237 would be a more ideal location. But I mean, this is a location that, you know, that someone may want very much, would, could be interested in building an Amazon or some kind of warehouse distribution place. I, I understand. That, there's a new Amazon warehouse not, not far from me as well. Yeah. There, there are lots of other places where you can build any, any warehouse within um, San Jose. So my question is, what? My concern here is what are we trading, right? What the impact on our environment um, is, a, is significant, especially if you look at uh, climate change and its impact. Um, there are very few places like this available. There's lots of places you can build a warehouse, but there are very few places like this available. And are we willing to give up on our given environment to create hardscape that could be placed somewhere else that that's my question but thank you guys for for your input i appreciate it and i i do have the numbers that were requested by commissioner oliviero um let's the, let's, let, let's oh did commissioner control also ask that question yes oh, okay good that's fine go ahead yeah, the total number of employment lands in the city of San Jose acreage wise is 12,301 acres um, with uh, the total of the 937 acres uh, purchased by post and OSA in the city and the 314 developable acres, um, it would be, result in roughly 10%. But if you remove the th 937 acres that were already purchased, it's the two percent of all employment lands. So that would be a two percent question, reduction. I think the question is that we. I think that something like fifteen percent of the city's land is dedicated for employment uses, right? And if we, if you remove that three hundred and what fourteen acres, what does that percentage proportion of employment land drop down to? I imagine it doesn't. It's go two percent. So you're saying it goes down, it drops 2%. Is it that is it two percentage points or is it, it sounds like it's 2% drop, but not from 13 per 15% to 13% of all land. See what I'm saying? I see, I see. see so the, I think there, yes, there's a two, maybe a 2% drop in employment land, but that proportionally doesn't mean that the city's share of, of, of jobs lands of all land uses goes from 15% to 13% for example. So that's what we need to figure out. I see. That'd be great. Great. It'll, it'll give me one second. I'll figure figure that total out as well. Yeah, why don't we move on to- I was uh, just, oh, just going to say, that's let Commissioner Kencho, if you have another question. Oh, no, I'm done. Thank you very much. So what we'll do then is we will move on to Commissioner Casey, and then when we have the answer, you'll, you'll let me know. Thanks, Chair. Uh, this question is probably for Vera. A um, number of the public attendees made the assertion that this change in designation would constitute a taking. Um, could you provide some color around that claim? I don't I don't agree with that assertion um, on legal grounds. The reason is that they are still left with uses of their property. 
and there is no guarantee that anyone will have the highest best use of their property. Um, but as long as there is some use left, then um, that then it is not a taking. I'll give you an ex I'll give you an example. We have areas in the city where the viable use has been a cell tower <laughs> on a number of acres on a mountains, you know, on a hill somewhere because they can't build because of our urban our, our hillside requirements. And that is not a taking. So it is viable uses of the property. And from what I'm hearing is there are left viable uses of the property. And also um, this property has been designated for other than agricultural uses for a very, very long time, for several decades now. And there has been no development on that property. So that speaks to lack of viability potentially too. And because there's one applicant for something doesn't mean that that's necessarily viable use throughout either. So um, I, you know, so um, I think there's sufficient evidence in the record um, that agriculture is viable um, or that there are other uses under that designation that are viable as well. And I think that that staff can tell you if you desire what all those uses are. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Chair. Do we have uh, the answer, Mr. Rivera? Yes. So the from the data that I have on the all employment land uses within the city of San Jose, the percentage drop from roughly 2% roughly from 16% um, to 14%. So, okay, so it's a proportional drop, percentage point drop. Yeah. With three, is that 314 acres or reduce it from 16% of all land in the cities dedicated for employment uses to 14% of all? No, that's the total 900, 937 and the 314. Yeah, okay. You calculate it just on the 314 if you can. Sure. Poor Robert, you are literally living my worst nightmare. Math <laughs> pro pro problems <laughs> with the world watching. <laughs> and uh, math in public. Yeah. That's and really late good. at night with an audience. That's it, it, even worse. It, it, yeah, yeah, no, poor, poor, <laughs> I'll tap, tip my hat to you, Robert. So, yeah, I was a, yeah, I was I, a human, uh, yeah, social studies major. So. Yeah, if you're political science. Uh, I'm going to go to Commissioner Garcia. And then, Robert, when you have that answer, you, you can let me know. Commissioner Garcia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair Bonilla. So, I think, I think uh, what's getting lost in the conversation here is, is, um, not necessarily the percentage of, of land that we're losing for jobs, but the percentages of lands that are getting redesignated or, or rezoned that somebody already owns 100% of. So, I mean, it's, it's one thing to take the 900 and some odd acres that the city has already acquired and converting that to open space but to take uh, properties that these private landowners have and rezoning them to effectively devalue them is the, the real troubling nature of this, right? In, in my opinion, right? And, and as far as the, the conclusion of the 100 page report of economic sustainability, there's no quantitative data in there. Where's the quantitative data that shows the financials of these um, operations? You know, if, if you buy a multifamily building, the first thing you look at is are the numbers. You know, you want to see the financials. What, you know, what is what is the cap rate? What are the, you know, what what does it look like? What am I getting for my money? And there was a lot of feel good pictures in that report, but not a whole lot of quantitative data. Maybe I missed it, but I didn't see any financials to, to prove the economic sustainability of agricultural farmland today as you know as it stands. So so if I missed that, please show it to me. But until they can come up with those numbers, I'm not just gonna take them at their at face value that, that it's sustainable. It's we need to see the numbers. So are, are, are there numbers available, uh, 
Mr. Meehan in that report that Mr. Meehan can show us? Or do we need to reevaluate this once we get them? Through, uh, through the chair, if I may respond to that. Um, the, I, I guess I'm unclear what the request is in terms of numbers. We've looked at a lot of different business models and every business has wildly different expenses and margins. The scales, the economies of scale uh, make a huge difference um, from one year to the next makes a huge difference. And again, you have, then you have to take into consideration what the uh, existing constraints are and how those might change, how the market is changing. It's an extremely dynamic um, economic area to model. And so uh, what I tried to present tonight was examples of successful operations or expanding operations or new operations um, where I suppose we could assume that those operators have no idea what they're doing and are making poor investments. Um, but I think it's also easy to assume that because there are numerous people making those choices, that they're doing it with sound numbers in their own financial and they're not just spending their money away. So it's it's really difficult and, and I'd say precarious to get into averages when you're talking about agricultural operations, because again, the scale and the dynamics of each operation don't bear a lot of bearing uh, or relation to one another. Um, however, we've certainly sat down with a handful of farmers that have been willing to show us their books. And um, I think very few businesses will do that. Um, however, uh, I, I'm not, so I'm not sure exactly if you're looking what, what you would be looking for. Um, an economic analysis of the profitability of farms was not a component of the work that we've done. Yeah, if, and if I can add to this, so, you know, there are, what we've learned is there are farmers down there making a go and doing farming. Is it the most lucrative business? No, probably it's not. I mean, I think that's sort of the issue is there are people that, that make a go at it and they, and, they, and they can sustain it, but it's not, the most profitable use for your land if you're a property owner particularly if you've you know even you know men, many of these families have owned their land for a very long time they don't want to farm anymore their grandkids their kids do not want to farm at some point they're, they're going to want to sell it and pass the money on to the family and the best way to do that is to change the land use or to maintain the land use at a higher value of, of a higher use because industrial land, land for housing, other type of uses are going to have more value than land for ag. So it's not that, you know, that there, there are people making a go at farming. The issue is that farming is not going to get you the best and uh, high return on your land when you look to sell it. And I think that's the, that's, and so I think that's the thing you need to sort of think about. When we do planning, our, our role is to sort of further our general plan and city goals. It's not about we don't analyze how it affects the value of the land. Now we can't do takings, and this is as noted is not, would not be a taking because there are uses that you, for the land that the property owners could still use. But our, our role is really focused on what is the best, what it, how do we best achieve the city's goals? What is the best approach? And, and it's not, it doesn't take into consideration of how a land use change is going to impact the value of the land. So I just want to sort of bring, just raise that issue or point. Commissioner thank Garcia, you. do you have any more questions or comments, Commissioner Garcia? No, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, Commissioner Oliverio. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so the city and other government entities uh, compensated some landowners that were billionaires in this area, and I'm based because of the you know wanted to change the use of their land, so they were compensated monetarily. Is there any plan here to compensate these small family owned properties? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no plan that we as planning staff are involved in. Um, there are maybe efforts afoot of some of the um, various, you know, post and, and Santa Clara Open Space Authority that may want to buy lands. There is, if you notice in our in our lengthy 
list of recommendations there is a recommendation to continue to explore establishing a climate credit. And so that's so the, the, the study, what it's doing is it's studying sort of the value of the land to sequester carbon and, and to not develop it. And so there's a value there. And it's the kind of thing that either if a project is building in North San Jose and has environmental impacts that they can't mitigate, potentially they could buy climate credits from a property owner in Coyote Valley to, um, to, to sort of make up for their impacts elsewhere in the central part of San Jose. Or there are companies, for example, that um, are, have corporate goals of sustainability of being net carbon, carbon neutral and that there would be opportunities for them to buy cl climate credits from property owners in Coyote Valley. So that's an action item. It's, it's an ongoing body of work that we're recommending that the council give us direction to continue that work. So there could be some kind of mechanism to sort of, you know, um, to, to buy, you know, to, to, to provide compensation to property owners for um, keeping their land as either ag or open space. Okay, thank you for that. So there's nothing concrete to compensate these small family landowners as the as was done for the billionaire landowners is what I'm hearing. There's potential, but nothing that you know of. That's correct. Nothing on the city's part. No. Okay. This time. Yeah, I just think that's I, I just think that's an amazing. Uh, uh, doesn't you know? Uh, we make a lot of discussions about you know different small businesses and small property owners, and here you have. Uh, essentially smaller, much smaller property owners than the billionaire property owners that receive compensation directly from government uh, on the, on their land in the same geographic area. So, um, uh, Chair, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. So you let me know if I can speak to that. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so on, when I was on the council, we had a city-initiated general plan amendment that was brought forward, and the property owner showed up and said, I don't want this to happen and the threat of litigation. And the city council voted unanimously to deny that city initiated general plan amendment. And uh, I'm having a hard time seeing any difference between that one and what's being proposed here. I personally don't think this is, you know, we know our role as the commission and we know the council is the larger body to uh, make something happen, such as compensating the property owners, but I don't have that in front of me. And I have the concern, especially when uh, one of the speakers is Norm Mattioni, one of the most preeminent attorneys on uh, private property rights that's speaking. And so I'm, you know, I am, uh, I genuinely feel that a tabling of the item or continuing the item with a note to you know council that you know this doesn't seem to be resolved and that you know the council can you know start making uh, whatever solution they can see happening. But at this point, uh, I'm I don't think this is essentially ready for prime time. Uh, I, in, a, in a perfect world, I think a study session in the last meeting would have been great because it would have been given us a lot to think about. Staff could have heard questions and concerns both from commissioners and the actual property owners. And maybe by the next commission meeting, there was some movement, but uh, I'm having difficulty uh, based on what I know and what I've experienced and what I've seen on the council on other city initiated land use general plan amendments where the property owner said no i don't want this and here's my attorney and the city unanimously voted to deny that city initiated general plan land use thank you chair thank you commissioner Oliverio. you know i'm going to weigh in now um you know i actually agree with uh, the points that were just made uh, my, my concern is that i think one of the things that really is at the core of the question is whether the land uh, actually can be used uh, in that quote agriculture uh, designation. Uh, I think we make the argument on paper that we can, but you know, as, as a business owner, you know, I run my company with uh, the idea of forecasting costs and understanding what those costs are gonna be in order to properly manage my company. I think we can all agree, water is the lifeline of agriculture. And yet we have nothing here in front of us in writing 
that is telling us, giving us guarantees, uh, showing us that these landowners, if in fact uh, they did want to uh, jump into agriculture, uh, would have the ability to 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 manage that cost. Uh, at the moment, it's it's kind of a it's a, it's a concept, but we, we don't have an official position from Valley Water. We don't really understand their thinking on this, uh, and that's problematic. Uh, the, the other part that I do find problematic, uh, again, is, uh, and I think, again, a lot of the questions that Commissioner Oliverio is asking are, are very in line with what I'm thinking, which is whether the families want to sell this land or not, or, or want its value to go up. The fact of the matter is that when you change that designation, you are changing what they can do with the land. And yes, you are impacting the valuation of that land. It would be the equivalent of someone coming to our home and saying, yeah, you know what, we're going to change its designation, uh, and 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 you have to be okay with that. Uh, but but don't worry, we we've done some studies that show that there's another path. And I'm not knocking the studies. Uh, I think, you know, within the questions that were asked, the, the studies did what they needed to do. But 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 I do feel that in my mind, you know, to keep this item here at the planning level with our limited powers is, is, is to not allow for both the property owners uh, who I think have a legitimate case here uh, because again, they've been here for, for, for decades, years, and, and now uh, it, it feels like overnight uh, their, their reality is going to change and that has impacts. And that's not to say that the environmental concerns aren't legitimate. We absolutely have to keep that in mind. Uh, but I, I, one of the things that I don't like is concepts that feel like you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, uh, and in my mind, this this isn't ready. Uh, this 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 requires uh, a a body that has a far more jurisdiction than the one we have to get to a place where conversations about agreements, conversations about carving things out, conversations about uh, giving landowners opportunities to maximize value. And yes, I mean, I think Commissioner Oliverio talked about there is a case couple of cases right in the immediate area where there was some level of compensation for, for land. So for me, this shouldn't get out of the planning commission as an approval. You know, we're either, we're either rejecting this thing and making it clear that the reason we're rejecting is because we're candidly not, there's just way too many questions, uh, not enough answers, too many complexities that are not accounted for. I mean, I go back to water. You're, you're saying that there's viability in the land because it could be agriculture, but yet when it comes to whether the, there's actual access to water, it's, it's still not clear. Uh, that, to me, that's, that's, that's big. So in my mind, we're either sending this up as a rejection, making it explicitly clear as to why. I actually prefer that route because it gives the landowners uh, and, and the city and, and the environmental groups as well. I think these are negotiations that have to happen with all parties, all stakeholders, gives them all the space to get together, talk, negotiate this thing out uh, in, in an arena where there is that legal ability to do that. Whereas here, you know, we may come back and table it, but we're, we're not getting any necessarily any closer to solving the, the bigger practical issues that all groups are having to deal with. So I think everything that needed to be said was said. Uh, I just kind of wanted to make sure that my position was on the record. I do see that Commissioner Young uh, and Commissioner Caballero and now Commissioner Torrance have their hands up. So I will go to Young, Caballero and Torrance. That sounds like the name of a powerhouse law firm here in San Jose. So uh, let's go Commissioner Young. <laughs> uh, Chair, thank you. I'd like to allow Commissioner Caballero to make her comments before I do, if, if that's okay. That is absolutely okay. Very, very kind of you, thank you. Um. Thank you. So sorry, bear with me. I've, I've lost my voice, which is why I've been voting with my thumbs today. Um, I was on the general plan task force and uh, this item came before the task force, I believe twice uh, and garnered many, many hours of discussion from over 30 people, including uh, who were on the task force, including um, 
and all of the folks who came and spoke on behalf or in opposition. Um, we do have a uh, motion on the floor. Um, it did not have a second yet because you wanted to wait to hear everyone else's. At this time, I'd like to support Commissioner Torrens's approval of the staff recommendation as stated, um, because I do think that there has been significant conversation. And I do think that there has been opportunity to have uh, these discussions. And I think that the staff recommendation is a good recommendation for the health and well being of our community moving forward. Um, I understand both what Commissioner Oliverio and Bonilla have said, and even Commissioner Garcia. Um, However, I also acknowledge that those are things for the city council to decide and to figure out what to do with. So um, with that, I make a motion. Uh, I, I second Commissioner Torrens's motion to approve the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Caballero, and thank you for using your voice. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Young, Torrens, Cantrell, Oliverio. And then we'll call for the vote after Oliverio. Thank you, Chair. Um, I can't support this as it's being proposed I, for many reasons. Um, and I won't repeat them all. A lot of what Commissioner Olivero and um, Chair Bonilla said, um, you know, is agriculture viable in the, Santa, in the Coyote Valley? I, I think reasonable people can disagree, right? I think... Uh, the landowners are telling us it's not. Um, Mr. Mian from the county made a very compelling presentation that it is. Um, I will make the observation though that we haven't had a single farmer or person that wants to become a farmer speak to us in support of this change. We've had a lot of landowners tell us that it's not viable. So, but really, the question is whether it's viable or not is, is it's going to change the valuation of the land, as Michael said, and lower the valuation. And I think there should be some process in fairness to compensate these landowners for that change in value. Um, I don't know what it would be. Uh, it could be the city could purchase the land, the the open space district could pay fair market value for the land. Um, Michael. Uh, mentioned climate credits, development credits. I think that's very creative. Um, but without that, um, you know, the uh, without those details, I, I cannot support it. And the other thing I'd like to say, the other reason I can't support it is the. And, and by the way, I just want to say that um, I'm I love the Coyote Valley. Uh, I spent a season in 2010 as a seasonal park ranger at Lexington Reservoir and our patrol area was the Coyote Creek Trail. So I spent a lot of time in the Coyote Valley. It's absolutely beautiful. I love it. My heart lifted when I heard two years ago that the, you know, the city and the open space district bought all the acreage they did. So, um, and I, with one exception that I'm gonna mention, I support changing the designation of the land to agriculture but it has to be done with fairness and it has to be done in a way that the landowners can be compensated for that loss of value. Um, but the last thing I wanna say is I think these 314 acres that are remaining for development, um, there's 17,400 acres in the Coyote Valley and we're talking about 314 acres. Um, I think those should be retained. I think that we had a presentation last week at our study session that there's only 12% available land for development. We had a presentation that a lot of the small industrial um, operations like machine shops and small manufacturing that support our large tech industry no longer have places where they can locate. Wouldn't it be wonderful if on those 314 acres of land we could have a small industrial park with those kind of businesses in them. Businesses like machine shops and small manufacturing that can provide good jobs, good working class jobs that don't require a, you know, an advanced degree as others have mentioned. Um, I, I don't think we should assume it's gonna be a warehouse. We don't know that. In fact, the city has <laughs> the option to approve or deny whatever's proposed. But I think really what we're talking about is should those lands 
be um, preserved for employment, I think they should. Uh, the staff report says there's 5,500 jobs. That's a lot. Uh, we are a next net exporter of jobs. We're the only major city in the United States where our daytime population is lower than our nighttime population. That's because we're exporting jobs. We need more jobs in the city. These jobs, where they're located, um, I'm not an expert on the VMT, but I can tell you this, that these jobs are reverse commute jobs. So rather than people traveling from South San Jose North, as they do now, these jobs would be people coming from South San Jose to the Coyote Valley. Um, that's a good thing. So uh, I, you know, I will stop now, but I, I cannot support the, uh, the motion as it currently stated. Thanks. Commissioner, I've lost track. Was it Torrance, Torrance. after yeah. Young? Torrance, sorry. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, one to one point, I think it was Commissioner Oliverio's uh, about the billionaire landowners that were compensated. We don't know the financial status of these landowners. They could very well be billionaire landowners that have held this for a long time. We, we just simply don't know, but um, they have assumed some amount of risk not knowing what their land was going to do, as we all assume risk when we own land and real estate. Uh, so there is that. And secondly, um, the earth needs a good lawyer is a tagline, right? We've heard. Vera has said, this is not a taking. And so there will still be viable uses of this land and those will be determined. And thirdly, if we pave paradise, we are not getting it back. This is our historic opportunity to protect this gem of land. And so I stand by my motion. Uh, Cantrell, Lardinois, and then we'll call for a vote. So I, I, you know, I know this is, this is complicated or seems complicated, but to, to me, it kind of boils down to uh, the reality. Uh, real estate speculation is honorable. It's, you know, that's, that's what we do, right? As, as humans, we try to hold it as long as we can to get value out of it. Generational speculation has really caused this land to not be used for what it could have been used for. I think we, we saw within this report that this could have been viable land for agriculture if wells weren't allowed to fail, if developers or landowners invested in that use of this property, which much of it had been used in that way. So, you know, I, I think there's a reality that, you know, generational speculation has probably increased the value of this land. Period. So today it's at a higher value than it was when it was purchased. I'm, I'm pretty certain of that. I don't have any evidence, but I'm pretty sure of that fact. So selling today is at an appreciated value if you held land for a hundred years. So I think that's a fact pretty close to certain. No one has a crystal ball. No one is entitled to a perceived value for land that they've held with no value. They, they created this situation with, with not maintaining this land for its use. That's a choice. Today is the day that we make a decision to not allow that vacant land to be a blight on the farm community and to become productive in a different way. I think that's the choice we're making today. I think we cannot say that Billionaires profited and small family owners do not. I think if you want to sell your land, you could sell your land. You could have sold it probably to Post or anyone else. You made a choice to continue to hold that land. You may have held that hand too long. I'm sorry. I don't, I think you own that land, yes. You can put that land to use for certain. No one's taking your land. You made a choice, you gambled. I don't even know if you're losing, to be quite frank. I think you saw, you've seen some valuation increase on that land um, and you're entitled to that. When you wait too long, 
you're entitled to that. So I really think, you know, this is, this is probably one of the most important decisions I've made so far on this commission. And yes, I do believe in, in helping small business and, and, you know, helping to, to transition things, but that's not our argument. That's city council. What we're doing today is making a determination that this path forward is the right path forward that there may be opportunity within city council to make other concessions. That's their role, that's not ours. Our role is to move forward this plan so that there, the greater benefits can be given to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cantrell. All right, Commissioner Lardinois, and then we will call for the vote. Thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, Commissioner Cantrell, you said um, this is one of the most important decisions that we've had on this commission in quite some time. And I, I totally agree with that. Um, and I, I understand that this is a very large item. There's a lot of details that are important, but I also want to say respectfully, I think some of the discussion has been missing the forest for the trees. Um, you know, going back San Jose's history, particularly half a century ago. Um, urban sprawl was the name of the game, and that is the root of so many of the problems that we're dealing with in this city today. Uh, and, you know, and this is something that we've at least ideologically very much moved past. I mean, it was controversial at the time, like the city manager became so unpopular that the people elected to council it threw him out. And in more recent times, we've written a general plan that very much is about limiting further urban sprawl and promoting infill development. So, uh, you know, I totally echo everything that Commissioner uh, Torrin said. This is an important, Coyote Valley is an important natural, natural, excuse me, resource that we need to protect. But also, more fundamentally, what we're voting on tonight is about good city planning and in a very broad, big picture sense, what we think the future of development in San Jose should be. And so I just want to say I am in support of the staff recommendation and I'm going to be voting yes on this motion. All right. So with that, um, I will go ahead and call the roll call vote. Oh, and I'm first, so let me just make it very clear before I, before I vote. Uh, I'm voting no. And the reason I'm voting no is for no other reason than the fact that here we are at 10.51 p.m. And there are clearly tons of gaps in this that we don't have answered yet. And I've been doing this for 25 years. There are questions that I have that at the moment haven't been answered. I go back to the water question. An important question to me because it also in my mind helps define whether in fact there is a question of a taking or not so my reason i'm voting no is because i do feel though at this point that to keep it at our level is candidly to kind of continue this conversation when this has to go to the council they need to figure it out they need to take the approach in terms of negotiating between the environmental groups landowners and of course yes i agree the, 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 the future plan they have for the city. So uh, I vote no. Casey? No. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell? Yes. Garcia? No. Lord and Watt? Yes. Oliverio? No, and to your point, Chair, it's it, open space is really important, but people need to be compensated. And if they want to do a parcel or bond measure, then we can support that so everyone's treated equally, not just billionaires. Thank you. Ornelas Wise? Oh, she's, that's right. she's off. I apologize. You see, it's that late. Uh, Torrance? Yes. Young? No. No. There's five no's. Four yeses. The motion fails. Uh, 
Okay, Jennifer, are we ready to move on to? Well, no, you have, the motion fails, but are you gonna, there is no recommendation, right? Ah, so then. Right, Rivera, I mean, the motion to approve second. You, you need to make you need to make a motion uh, to deny. So if that's what if that's what you're intending. So do we have a motion on the floor to deny? Mr. Commissioner Young, I make a motion to deny the staff recommendation. Do we have a second? Second, second Oliverio. Okay, let's open up the roll call vote again. Tonia, no. Casey. Wait, let's make clear here. We're... <laughs> Yes or no? Sure, are you sure you're voting no? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, say it again. Oh, 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 yes, yes. Of a yes, of a yes, of a yes. Why did you have to say something? <laughs> no, I, you know, in, no in, in full disclosure, when we get to the end of the meeting, you'll know why. Uh, I've been up since 4 a.m., so my, my, my apologies. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? No. Cantrell? No. Garcia? Yes. Lord and Watt? No. Oliverio? Yes. Torrance? No. Young? Yes. Motion passes five to four. Are we ready to move on now, Jen? Yes. Okay. Item nine, continue the general plan hearing 2021 cycle two to November 10th, 2021. Is there anything staff needs to say on that? Uh, we should get a motion in a second since you're uh, continuing the hearing. Okay. We have a motion on the floor. So move. So move. All right. Oliveri with the motion. Who's the second? I'll second. Lord and Wah, okay, yeah. per perfect. Bonilla, yes. Casey? Yes. Caballero? Yes. Cantrell? Yes. Garcia? I apologize, what are, what are we voting on right now? Continuing the general plan hearing, uh, 2021 cycle two to November 10, 2021. Yes. Lord and Yes. Oliverio? Yes. Torrance? Yes. Young? Yes. Motion passes. All right, item 10, referrals from city council boards, commissions, or other agencies. I don't have anything. Um, I wasn't, I didn't see. That's, yeah. No, no pressure, We're, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Sure. I, item 11, good and welfare. Uh, A, report from city council, staff their report. I don't have anything on that either. Perfect, I'm okay with that. There, there haven't been any recent items before council. Thank you. Item B, subcommittee formation reports and outstanding business. Nothing on that for me. Uh, commission calendar and study sessions. I'm not aware of anything to talk about on that one either. All right, that works for me. Item D, does anyone have anything to say for public record? Uh, yes, Chair, Commissioner Young. Commissioner Young, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, I'd just like to say, um, Chair Bonilla, that I support your comments about affordable housing and how, they, how it needs to be distributed evenly throughout the city. Um, for example, uh, my district, District 9, historically has not done our share of affordable housing. Um, and I think it has disproportionately gone to the east side. The good news is in District 9, we now have three affordable housing projects being considered. 
But I just think it's really important to say that every part of the city needs to step up and provide affordable housing. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that, Commissioner Young. Anyone else have anything for the public record? All right, well, that I, I do. Uh, I, I'd like to end this meeting in memory of Mr. Antonio Rodriguez, a lifelong Eastside resident who passed away at the beautiful age of 91 this morning. He happens to be my father-in-law. So I just wanted to end the meeting in his memory. Uh, and that's why I've been up since 4 a.m. So forgive me if I was sloppy tonight. But uh, uh, as always, colleagues, thank you for your professionalism. Thank you for how you conduct your business. And everyone have a great night. See you at the next one. See you all thank later. you, Rolando. Sincere thank condolences you. to you and your family. Thank you. Thank you. My sympathies for Rolando. Thank you.